Aloha mai kako. My name is Nainoa Thompson, and I'm standing here in the middle of the Pacific Ocean in my home, the Hawaiian Islands. And I'm really, really honored and, and privileged and, uh, and humbled to be a part of this important uh, conference, which essentially is about defending the deep. And essentially that means that I think that it's aimed at what I believe as the greatest challenge environmental challenge of the 21st century is protecting the oceans because that's how you protect the earth and the earth protects us as humankind and and thank you to the sustainable ocean alliance and the ocean project to to bring this all together um you know i'm not a scientist i'm i'm kind of a weekend warrior sailor and um but i've been um again honored and privileged to be in a school a special school um when I was a young person and I was trying to find out who I am as an indigenous Native Hawaiian, um, there was a, a project called Hokulea, and it built a deep sea voyaging canoe that would, first time in 600 years that would go and explore um, how in the world did the largest nation on earth, 600 times more water than land, um, called Polynesia, be discovered. And we were so blessed that there was a a single individual that would change the world. And, um, and um, his name is Pi Luk, but everybody referred to him as Mao. Mao means to be fierce. And he comes from a 3,000 year genealogy and legacy of deep sea navigators. And at the time when we needed him, he was one of six masters left on earth. And he was the youngest. He is the edge and was the edge of extinction of the great navigators of the Pacific. And, he was brilliant. He would find Tahiti in 1976, change the world about, uh, about our history and, and what others wrote about us. And ultimately, he brought pride and dignity back to us as a people, which is foundational to the health of who we are. And then he came back for 30 years and trained us. And so I bring him into the room um, as, as one of the great teachers that should be remembered and because uh, he's from the Pacific. He's from an island called Satawa in the Western Carolines in Micronesia. Mile long, half mile wide, highest soil is eight feet. It's an atoll, <clears throat> no lagoon. Um, and he comes on that island is the 3,000 year school called Woryang. It was the most powerful of all the navigation schools. And he's the last. And in those, when he came to train us, that the, the gift of teaching, us young people who didn't know anything. Um, we didn't know anything. And, and so I remember the early times and our lessons are really was on the deck of the canoe, not even knowing where to stand, how to look, how do you sleep, how do you walk? Uh, and so we just watched. And uh, this man, you only know where you are on the ocean by memorizing where you come from. And what you got to memorize is nature. He is the world's, one of the world's great naturalists. And he would stand there on his feet to feel wave come from left to right foot uh, underneath the hulls of the canoe. He would, um, and he'd watch nature. He'd make 5,000 observations in a single day. Heavens, cosmos, uh, atmosphere, clouds, wind, uh, ocean surface, waves, sea life, birds. He would integrate that whole system of life in the oceans to be able to make choices. And so you make maybe 500 choices a day. Turn left, turn right, uh, move the balance, um, trim the sail. And he would just constantly be adjusting to the natural world because he knew the systems, the whole system and how it worked. And then he would take this canoe 2,400 miles from Hawaii to Tahiti, miracle. And so we're on there, we're just watching him and. Um, and then those 500 choices would turn into two decisions, sunrise and sunset. Where are you? Where are you going? And so I just begin to imagine, what if you had 8 billion people on a canoe called the Earth, and they make 500 decisions a day? That means it's 4 trillion human decisions a day. What if they were good ones? What if we started to make good ones? And I reflect on this intergenerational mix 
that is in this conference today, it's the right thing to do. You know, I think about the choices my great-grandfather made or my grandfather made. They, when in hindsight, we look back at history and say, yeah, they were the wrong, maybe the wrong choices that got us into the situation we are today where we're not sustainable and that extinction is too high and all those kinds of issues. But they had an excuse. They didn't know. They didn't know that the input of industrialization onto the world is going to change culture, it's going to change ecology, and it's going to change climate. They didn't know, but we do. And yet, it is so, there is no excuse for my generation to still make, with the information we have, to still choose the wrong choices. And so, I think that what we need to focus is on you, on young people that are in an extraordinary world. And I think that this conference of, of bringing young voices into this room and then having them speak with generations across. Sylvia, Dr. Sylvia Earle and Sven Lindblad, they're not only friends, they're heroes of mine. They, uh, while others, so many, were maybe making compromised choices, they weren't. They, they were forging ahead with a, a passion for this planet. And in, ultimately, in the end, you know, when Sylvia, her, her deepness is because it, she made more dives underwater than any other woman on the planet's history. And Sven Lindblad has taken these expeditions, and what they really create are schools, are schools for us to remember. And th this intergenerational mix is crucial. But ultimately, in the end, um, our generation helps, needs to guide, not to lead. Our generation needs to support from behind. And our generation, I think, gets, gets this extraordinary moment of time, maybe a decade, maybe a two, where we can be a part of, I think, the greatest human movement on the face of the earth in human history time. It's the greatest human movement that has ever happened, and I've seen it, because I sailed around the world, and I went to 30, 370 ports on the planet, and it was meeting strangers who are doing something in reaction to what they're knowing that, that we're doing some terribly wrong to our home. That they, whether they're in their classroom, whether they're in the halls of the university, whether they're in their backyard, whether they're in a coral reef, whether they're in a watershed, they're doing what they can. Every single act of kindness is not just for anybody in an isolated community, it's for all of us. And this movement, this, this movement, this human movement of millions of people across the planet, it's not, it's not organized, it, it's not institutionalized, and it should never, never be. It's happening. But now I'm crystal clear that the focus of the greatest navigators in a different way are in this room. And they're in schools today. They're entering preschool, they're entering kindergarten. They're coming into our schools. That's why you need Sven. That's why you need Sylvia. What we teach them needs to shift. And, and this room, and the reason why I am so excited is because know, one of my other great teachers is, my mother and father are gone. They were my most important, but now it's my children. I have 12 year twins. And, it was about six days ago that um, we had a lunar eclipse. So of course dad's got it all right. Come on kids, we're gonna take, get your iPads out, let's go photograph the moon changing and, and uh, watch it get dim and watch it get bright. And they were like almost not even listening to me and my son was, had the headset on and I think it was Minecraft that he was watching on his big TV and he didn't hear a word I said and so I almost needed to get a crowbar, it, because now that the moon is getting smaller, I had to almost get a crowbar to crowbar that headset off his head and tell him to come out inside and do something that's really real. Come be with the moon at this very special time. And so he comes out, he leans on the rail, he looks around, and he just couldn't wait for his father to give him permission to go back in the house, but he's looking. And then it starts to rain. And then... Um, he goes back in the house, and I'm like frustrated. So 
I come back and irritate him by sitting right next to him, and and I and I look at what he was doing on Minecraft. Before he went out, the grass was green in what he was constructing. When I came back in, it, it was silver. And uh, so I said, how come the grass is silver now? He said, Dad, because it was raining. And when the light of the moon came over the ridge, it turned it silver. Then he just frustrated, puts his headset back on. And I backed up and said, wow, he's watching. He sees. And in the Minecraft, he's designing, he's engineering, he's, he's, he's shaping his future. And he sees nature. And the thing that's so powerful, he's doing it with his friends. And so when I think about where we are in the room, when I think about the trauma in the Pacific, I think about this next generation who has the capacity and the ability to see our mistakes. That's a legacy of change. They, they, this, this generation has the ability to access information any second of the day. This generation can explore the whole world with powerful tools that we have through satellites and through technology and to learn fast. This generation is the first real generation that has a real chance to understand the systems and how it works of life on Earth for the first time. And the most important thing, they can connect. They can connect. And so this generation is already mobilizing. And the things that they don't believe in anymore, they're in the streets and they're standing up. We don't want to live in a place of racism. We don't want to be divided by the, by the dangerous divisions of, of nationalism. We don't want to sit back and watch climate change, a storm run us over. And, 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 they're, and, and we're organizing. This conference is more important than maybe you know that in the ingredients of this conference, bringing in the best of the heroes of our time, to, to blend it into the, to the young. And uh, I believe the greatest, I always reject the notion when there's this argument that says the age of exploration is over. No. The age of new exploration is just begun. The age of researching the earth is never over. It never is over. But there is a new generation that is obligated to heal the earth. And it's in the young. And I believe that, um, I mean, I envy you. A, a virtual audience I can't see. But I'm told that the Seychelles and the Cook Islanders, the communities, are getting together and saying, we're not going to let us destroy our home by making the wrong reasons based on profit and, and, and exploitation. I imagine that this generation can, can go to Greenland and talk to a young scientist who's measuring unprecedented melt from its ice packs. And in a nanosecond, it can be in Majwa, halfway across the world, listening. And I know, because they're writing poetry for their dying islands. And to know that these young people across the world are connected. And, and that's what I think is so powerful about what the possibilities are. And I do know and I believe in that the reason why this generation is going to heal the earth because they know what to stand up for and they're willing to know what to fight for. And, um, and uh, because they have, they have these tools that we never had. And so I want to aloha you folks. I want to thank Sylvia and Sven for being here. And I want to thank um, all of you who have the courage to take on what we could not um, heal in our time. And so my best to you and, and, and take good care. And so good morning, planet Earth. Here we are again on the bottom of the ocean. What is down there? Until you go down and explore, you just don't know.
it's just like science fiction, but it's the reality. The single greatest impediment to studying the deep ocean is that it's not as transparent as air. I can look up with my own eyes and see the surface of the moon a quarter of a million miles away, but I can't even see half a mile into the ocean. A lot of people seem to view the deep sea as sort of out of sight, out of mind, but the, the deep ocean affects everything else on the planet. Most of the carbon on Earth is in the deep ocean, and that carbon can stay there for a very long time if the deep sea ecosystem is functioning properly. We used to think that the deep sea would be like a desert, that we wouldn't find much life here. After all, we are so deep underwater that there is no light from the sun. There is no photosynthesis. But as we began exploring the depths of the ocean, we learned that there is plenty of life, animal life. Where there's water, there's life. The deeper we go, the weirder it gets. Today, we saw something that we certainly have never seen before. It looked like he was basically collecting bacteria off what appeared to be a smaller female with eggs and was eating that bacteria. So he was literally grooming this smaller shell, just in the same way that you would see chimpanzees, for instance, picking bugs off of the hair of a mate or group members. Incredible to see that same type of behavior in crabs. Crazy hydrothermal rock full of noxious chemicals, arsenic and selenium, and it's potentially radioactive, and yet it is teeming with life. All kinds of challenges living in an environment like this, yet life proliferates. When we find these unusual habitats, it gives us another end member in which to put other deep sea habitats into context, but also maybe give us some insights into the past, not only on Earth, but possibly we can think about other planetary worlds, watery worlds. It's one of the most magnificent things that I've ever seen in the natural world. It's a spiritual experience. It's not just a scientific experience. It changes you. It's one of those last places where it's a safe haven for fish uh, since it's closed. And not only that, but dumbo octopuses and six-gill sharks and lots of corals that are probably like a thousand years old and would want to keep it that way and have it stay that way. Now we know they're here, we have to think about and worry about what's going to happen to them in the future. Mining has a potential to destroy a lot of these corals because uh, the future of mining is looking at these hard substrates, uh, which is where the corals grow. Just because you can't see it or eat it doesn't mean it's not an important part of our planet. The deep sea is something that needs to be taken care of and managed very carefully in the coming years. The deep oceans is kind of like the engine of climate, slowly moving but actually ultimately controls the destiny of our planet almost. Because of course in the ocean nothing happens in isolation. Everything is connected both horizontally and vertically. So now having this extra layer of knowledge is going to be incredibly useful for any future management. If the deep sea is all one big unit, then you know you could put a few protected areas wherever it was convenient and that would take care of it. But if the deep sea is in fact divided up, into a bunch of biogeographic units, then it's important to have protected areas in each one. By communicating the beauty and majesty of these systems, their importance to the natural world, to global biogeochemical cycles on this earth, we're making people fall in love with the ocean. Everything in the world that's alive is basically forms a tapestry that ultimately holds us. And I think it's important to think about that because every time you lose something, you lose a thread out of the tapestry that ultimately supports us humans.
Welcome, everybody. We'll just give uh, a minute for others to join us in this uh, Q&A. I will start by uh, sharing my screen so I can talk a little bit about some of the amazing discoveries that we've made in Australia this year. So as you've seen in the video uh, that you just watched, the deep sea is incredible. It's unfathomable. It's dark, it's cold, it's a pressure-filled environment. And up until recently, we knew very little about this ecosystem. And in fact, we still know very little and we are learning day by day. With technological advancement, we have been able to characterize and see for the first time some of these incredible species and systems that we knew very little about. Since 2009, Schmidt Ocean Institute has been working to help explore and understand some of these remote frontier regions of our ocean planet. And through this exploration, we've been able to make some incredible discoveries. Particularly this year in Australia, while we've been operating Falkor, we have made some amazing discoveries that I would like to share with you today that really just goes to show how little we still understand our ocean system. Exploration-based science takes place on Falkor, and what this means is that we are trying to understand these systems, and it is critically important. Coral fossil samples will help us understand previous uh, ocean systems, and that will help to model for the future. We'll also be able to see for the first time and be able to connect deeper ecosystems to shallower areas, which will in turn help management. And we've been able to bring these deep sea frontiers to the public and to scientists all around the world with our underwater robot, Sebastian, capable of diving down to 4,500 meters. With 4K video camera, we can make it feel like you are on the deep sea floor while you're all in the comfort of your living room. And this has been incredible, not only for scientists, but for the world, especially this year when so many of us have been unable to leave our homes. This year, we had remote scientists working from their bedrooms and living rooms, conducting science with technology aboard our Falkor. And with this, we were able to make discoveries in real time, connecting scientists all around the world, having them collaborate, identifying new species and new ranges for things we never knew that existed before. This year in Australia, we have been able to conduct eight expeditions and two for 2021 are currently scheduled. This has been an amazing opportunity for us as there has been no dedicated underwater robot debt for science in the deep sea in Australia. And so this has allowed us to be able to explore some of this unique region. And with these explorations have come some incredible discoveries such as this whale fall in Bremer Canyon. Uh, this was discovered early in the year on the Western Australian side in conjunction with the University of Western Australia. The whale fall took place in Bremer Canyon, which is known as a place for biodiversity, but very little was known about its deep sea environment. Following that, we did work in the Ningaloo Canyons with the Western Australian Museum, and there we found new glass corals, octopus squid, and the world's longest species, 150-foot siphonophore. We then traversed to the east side of Australia into the Great Barrier Reef. Now this area is one of the most iconic features, but little was known about the deep sea environment there. We were able to explore the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park and the Coral Sea Marine Park, making new discoveries of black corals, fish species, and all kinds of incredible, wonderful, and brightly colored organisms. And then on October 20th, we were shocked to find a 500 meter reef in the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park that was the first to be discovered. There had not been a reef discovery in over 120 years. How did we miss a reef as tall as the Eiffel Tower? This is why exploration is so important. With high resolution mapping of the seafloor, we found the reef and later dove on it to find a thriving ecosystem with beautiful corals, fish, and sharks. And what wonderful news at a time when we hear about coral bleaching and destruction of our ocean systems. 
That same week, we also had the first live viewing of a ram's horn squid, where its shell was often found on beaches, but never seen before in real life. This is going to keep our scientists busy for a while. And really, the results of all these expeditions allow us to better understand and manage our marine systems. All of the data collected is open and publicly available so that scientists globally can access it and work to better understand these ecosystem connections. Technological innovation, as well as public participation through live streaming, through the arts, and through visualization allows us to better understand these scientific findings and share them with the world. With every expedition we learn with every dive, we have new insights, and we can do more to sustain and protect our living systems. And so with that, I would like to stop and talk a little bit more about some of the discoveries we made this year, as well as answer any questions that you might have. All right, let's see. Are there any questions from uh, the audience here? All you have to do is add it into the chat and our session monitors will pin it to the top so I might be able to address any questions or requests you have. So I'm looking so far and I see some great comments. Thank you so much. One of the questions that we have is what impact would deep sea mining have on releasing carbon stored in the sediment? Are there any estimates of how much carbon is stored in the seafloor? Um, Kathleen, that's a great question. Unfortunately, I don't have that answer. I'm doing a lot of the communications, not necessarily the direct science. But what I can tell you is a lot of the scientists that have come on our ship do do sediment coring, which means they're taking samples from the seafloor to better understand not only the chemistry of this area, but also the microbial community. So what's living down there and how that's affected by maybe carbon. Um, there's a lot of talk about carbon sequestration and how the deep sea can absorb some of the carbon. For those of you that don't know, our oceans absorb more carbon than anything else on the planet and really help to stabilize our ecosystem. So there are scientists that are looking at that, but unfortunately I don't have that direct answer for you today. Are there other questions I can help to answer? Okay, what would you say has been the most surprising discovery that Schmidt has made? Well, there's been so many. Um, I have a few personal favorites. In 2014, we discovered at the time the world's deepest fish. Since then, there's been a fish discovered, I think a few meters deeper, um, we called it the ghost fish, and this was in the Mariana Trench. Um, and it was just an incredible discovery at the time, something that surprised us that we didn't know um, we were going to find. And as of late, I would say the 500 meter tall reef discovery has been something that has captivated the world. I mean, the Great Barrier Reef is a very iconic place. Lots of people know about the system and to discover something that tall, you know, larger than the Eiffel Tower is just, how did we miss that? <laughs> so for me, those are the two that really stand out. Other questions that I can maybe answer for the group. Okay, thanks, Matthew. Question is, are you planning to take this amazing imagery to the UN or other international negotiating processes? Um, yes, so all of our uh, data that we collect, including our imagery and uh, videos is made publicly available. We consider that open source data. And so we do uh, license that for education purposes. And we work very closely with a lot of international partners that use our footage for education. So um, we just announced this morning, which I'm pleased to share with this group, that Schmidt Ocean Institute has um, a formal partnership with the uh, UNESCO IOC for the UN uh, Ocean Decade. So the United Nations Ocean Decade um, for Sustainable Development will allow us to share our footage and share our results and really try to bring together globally everyone to bring these data and bring the science together for better management and for a more sustainable ocean. And other questions come in, where are other regions Schmidt and Falkor are interested in or traveling to next? Great question. Um, on our website, we have all of our expeditions listed where you can take a look. 
we've done work all over the Pacific and globally, actually. Um, this year in 2020, we have dedicated on an Australia campaign, and we'll continue that into 2021. We've had some delays on our expeditions because of the global pandemic, and so we want to honor some of the expeditions we had to delay. Um, what's been amazing is we've been able to conduct science the entire year during the pandemic, um, which has been a, a huge challenge. And so we're very excited to continue our work in Australia. And after that, we'll continue out through the Pacific. Another question here came in um, from a communications perspective. What is a key piece of advice for successfully taking that work that you are doing into places that few people have, uh, I'm guessing the resources, uh, the opportunity to visit and engage with them? Okay, sorry, the, the question got cut off. Uh, yeah, from our perspective, one of the amazing things with technology is we're able to bring these remote areas to the world. So anybody with a laptop is able to view and see what we're looking at. And um, it doesn't even need a, a strong bandwidth to be able to explore some of these resources. We have images as well, and we make these openly available. We try to also bring these to large education groups that are working globally. Um, we work very closely with the National Marine Educators Association. We work with uh, school groups in each region that we're in to also create local impact so that we can share um, and educate the next generation uh, about these discoveries and about some of the imagery right in their own backyard that they may have not seen before. Another question is, can you explain the technology and maybe types of ships used to discover deep waters? Also, what are the most unique species that we have found? Great question. So um, there are all kinds of unique species and it sort of depends what type of science you're interested in. So there's a little something for everybody, especially because a lot of our expeditions it, um, use transdisciplinary work. So we have scientists that are um, in multiple different areas of science that are coming together. For example, um, on our previous uh, expedition, we had um, scientists or geologists that were really excited in the um, structure of these drowned reefs. So these ancient reefs and being able to understand the history of this area based on the geology. And then there was other um, scientists, there was a jellyfish expert from Japan that was really interested in the midwater column when we were descending and doing our dives. They really wanted to see what species were found there. And then we had squid experts when we found the ram's horn squid that were you know, really focused on that. So it kind of just depends on um, what keeps your interest. But I would say every dive we do, every region we look at, there's always something unique to that area that we didn't know before that we've learned. Um, so that is, I think, one of the amazing things about being able to do this work. And in terms of the technology, um, really what you need is an underwater robotic vehicle. And that allows you to be sort of the scientist eyes and hands. So it can allow for precise, delicate sampling, you can take videos so you're able to see, but there's uh, multiple uh, options of robotics out there. There's autonomous uh, systems and floaters and aerial vehicles, and it really depends on the type of science you want. But what's really amazing about the ocean science field is that the technology is growing so quickly that we're now able to characterize large swaths of ocean um, in ways we hadn't before. So we can have coordinated robotics, five, six vehicles out at the same time, really understanding an area from top to bottom, you know, um, from the surface of the air ocean interactions down to the deep sea. And that's really what's so important is being able not only to characterize one specific area, but to look at how they all interact with each other. Another question came in, uh, how would you say that the public knowledge and interest oh, is in the deep sea area? So I would say that public knowledge is definitely uh, increasing and there's more interest in that. Um, you know, especially I think this year as everyone was at home um, and, and reflecting more about how our planet and humans interact there's been a huge amount of interest in the science that we're doing. And um, 
I think that's only going to continue to grow. And while as we're able to bring the imagery and connect with groups to these deep areas, it allows us to share the story so much more and, and to promote that widely. Another question that's come in is, are the deep sea floors um, intact in Australia? Uh, that's a great question. Again, I am not a deep sea scientist um, specifically, so I wouldn't want to comment um, per se on, on that specific topic. But what I can say is from the imagery we've collected, um, we've seen really pristine environments. It's um, been amazing to see thriving systems in these deep areas. Uh, we've been able to understand a lot of the geology and we've been able to map a lot too, which is really important. Um, there is an initiative called Seabed 2030, which is trying to map the entire ocean floor globally by 2030. And this is really important because we still don't have at maps of our seafloor and what in high resolution. And this is important because we can't go do the science. We can't understand what's there without maps. And so um, we are partners as part of this um, initiative, global initiative. We share all the mapping data we collect with this group. And we've been able to contribute 1.1 square kilometer, million square kilometers of seafloor mapping to this initiative. And since the initiative started, we've gone from about 15% to 19% of our seafloor map. So that is a huge step in the right direction. We're very excited about that. And other questions come in. Um, are you looking at the role of these deep sea ecosystems and how they're playing into planetary processes? For example, how do they contribute to climate cycles, ocean current circulation, fisheries, marine food webs? Great questions. So um, we do not have staff scientists um, on our ship. What we do is we offer our research vessel to scientists globally for ship time. And they apply for ship time and we select those based on a peer review process. And so it's the questions that the scientists bring to us that we then um, offer the ship time for. And what we look for is frontier science. So science that's really cutting edge, looking to answer large scale questions that are going to make big impact Impacts and that are going to have a large effect on the science community. And so throughout the year since 2013, um, we've been able to answer some of those questions, Matthew, um, looking at air-sea interactions, uh, marine food webs, as well as climate cycles, especially looking at drowned reefs or past coral reefs and how that can help, that information can help model for future predictions of our ocean. So, um, for example, we have an expedition coming up on the 26th of December that will start called Pinging in the New Year, and it's a mapping cruise of the deep sea that will take place over New Year's to uh, the end of January. And that's going to be a partnership with James Cook University, as well as Seabed 2030. And we're very excited to be collecting some of the first data of the new year and making that publicly available. Those maps will then be used to better understand the seafloor, but also to go back and do further research. Another question here is, you've mentioned moving the project to the Pacific after Australia. Would the European side of Atlantic be focused for deep sea exploration in the foreseeable future? Great question. Um, we certainly, when we do our open calls to scientists for submitting um, applications for ship time, there is no geo geographic boundary. So it can be um, anywhere in the world. And in fact, when Falcor started, um, we refit the vessel from 2009 to 2012 in Germany. It was a German for fisheries enforcement vessel, and we started off in the Atlantic. Um, so there's certainly a chance we'll go back there. I would say for the next, um, our schedule's planned for 2021 and 2022, so we will be in the Pacific region for the next two years. That's a lot of questions. I hope I'm answering them um, as quickly as I can. Another question has come in. Do we have technology that can detect deep sea life? If we don't, why? Great question. So um, there are, are multiple ways to detect, detect sea life. Um, and I'd say one of the latest ways to do that that really has promising impact for the future is environmental DNA. And that's where you can take a water sample 
um, and really use that to understand what organisms are around with genetics. Now, it's not a perfect system, it's fairly new. You have to have an understanding of the genetics of these species. So as you're discovering new species, this is you know, an evolving process. But that's just one way the technology is evolving. As I mentioned before, as well as the robotic technology also allows us better insight to be able to collect samples and to view sea species. And that is also another way that we're able to detect sea life and better understand how they're interacting with these in deep environments. These are great questions, keep them coming. I think we have about seven more minutes, so I can probably take a couple more questions before we wrap up today. I really appreciate all the enthusiasm. Um, we will not be doing any robotic diving for the rest of the year. Um, we've wrapped that part up, but we are happy to um, showcase any of the science that we're doing with videos, as well as everything is held in perpetuity on our YouTube page. So if you're interested in highlights or any dives, you can go to our um, YouTube page and check out some of the dives that we've done. We have another question that's come in, is habitat restoration possible post deep sea mining? That's a good question, and um, unfortunately, I don't have the expertise to really uh, answer that question. What I found um, really interesting about some of the science that we've done um, in previous expeditions is they've shown that even within um, hydrothermal vent systems, from vent system to vent system, they are completely different. So they have different species and um, different functions. So if you um, eliminate one vent system, it doesn't necessarily mean that another vent system will populate it in the same way. So the genetics are really important to be able to understand how much diversity is in our deep sea and how much that differs between system to system. Another question that's come in is, are you planning any explorations in the Indian Ocean? We currently do not have uh, anything scheduled for the Indian Ocean, but I do know there are research vessels that do have plans to work in the Indian Ocean that are doing some work. Um, I would recommend checking out the Neptune Foundation as well as Ocean X. I believe they um, will be doing some uh, exploration work there in the near future. All right, any last questions before we wrap up today? One of the last things I'd like to share and encourage uh, everyone here who's passionate about the deep sea is to keep learning. Uh, we offer some an amazing uh, videos as well as lesson plans and not just Schmidt Ocean Institute. There are a lot of different organizations that do this. NOAA, Ocean Exploration, Ocean Exploration Trust, um, all offer some great educational material, Rev Ocean as well. There are a lot of different groups that are creating content about the deep sea and helping people to understand what's there. We have an artist at sea program as well, where we bring artists to work with the scientists aboard and to showcase some of the work we do in a unique way. And so, um, you know, if reading the science isn't really that appealing to you, there are other ways to be able to process some of the data that we do. We have one last question coming in here, and uh, that reef that we discovered, was it deeper than typical reefs? Why had it not been discovered before? Uh, great question, and I will, I will wrap up on this last question because I think it's a really good one. The reef that we discovered, it was a 500 meter tall reef, and while that's very tall, um, we scientists had missed it um, with some of the older mapping equipment. They really weren't able to do um, seafloor depth and understanding seafloor depth the way we can now with multi beam mapping. And so it's also in a very remote region. So it took a while for someone to go there and find it. Right. A lot of this has to do with resources, too, and being able to characterize and, and go out to these really remote areas. Um, it is not. Uh, deeper than other reefs. What was fascinating about it is because it's so tall, you could see hist history or time of the reef. So you have the very deep part of that reef is a drowned reef. And so those coral skeletons can tell you a lot. And as you get uh, 
shallower or closer to the surface, you'll see differences in the systems that, or the animals that are using that reef, right? As you get shallower, you see shallower corals, sharks, midwater column, you're going to see more jellies. Um, so it really just changes uh, based on the depth that you're at. But we do a lot of work with deep sea reefs. So we're not just, uh, we're, our focus is not necessarily on the shallow reefs. We do a lot of work in the 2,000 to 4,000 meter depth, which is quite deep when you think about it. Um, and, and the reefs there, what they offer, they look very, very different. If you've never seen a seamount and what some of the deep sea corals on a seamount looks like, I highly encourage you to do so. So with that, I uh, will like to thank everybody who's come today with the amazing questions and for your passion and participation. I'd also like to thank the uh, Sustainable Ocean Alliance and the Oxygen Project for being able to host such an incredible event. I would like to every, ask everyone to join us now to go back to the main stage for our, the Frontier Film Session and to encourage you to keep exploring the deep sea. Thank you so much. My name is Jeremy Agen. I'm 26 years old and from the small island developing state of Seychelles. I predominantly work with the Seychelles Islands Foundation, which manages and protects Seychelles' two UNESCO World Heritage Sites, the Valle de May and Aldabra Atoll, as their communications and outreach coordinator. In my spare time, I volunteer as a global shaper and also a young ocean leader with the Sustainable Ocean Alliance. Within the Sustainable Ocean Alliance, I am a member of its Youth Policy Advisory Council which has a campaign against deep sea bed mining and also advocates for youth's priorities within the blue economy. Deep sea bed mining is a little known activity with big implications. As a blue economy champion, Seychelles' position on deep sea bed mining is significant. Whether it can be included in a sustainable and equitable blue economy is a topic of discussion we should have and in my belief, it is not something that can be included in our blue economy. SOA is calling upon all of us to join a 10-year moratorium in line with the UN's Decade for Ocean Science to allow us to have more research on what the implications and risks are with such an activity. It's also a chance for the world to expand the circular economy, which could potentially create more solutions in, instead of risks and damages to our planet. As an African, as an islander and a young person, I believe this moratorium will give us the time to make informed decisions. It will also allow the International Seabed Authority's decision-making process to be more accountable, transparent and inclusive. We must take action now and be responsible so that we do not end up with a future that we, do not, that we cannot live in. This time is one in which we must ask the hard questions and include as many participants in this conversation. In Seychelles, we interviewed several Seychellois who are engaged in the topic of deep sea and the deep sea bed mining activities. This is a chance for you to listen to their opinions and ideas about what this means for Seychelles and the world. Um, the deep sea essentially is the ocean below 200 meters. So everything below that. And um, in Seychelles, we have a tendency of doing research where it's most accessible. So that's between zero and 300 meters um, in our marine ecosystems. Um, and being able to go further down um, in the deep sea requires a whole bunch of different types of specialized technology and equipment. So exploring the deep sea has been undervalued within our system just because we don't have the technology. But it's really important because it sustains life and there's still a lot that we don't know about the deep sea. Um, one of the amazing opportunities that Seychelles uh, and different organizations partnered with uh, was Necton uh, First Descent, 
which gave Seychellois and government a first glimpse to the ocean below scuba depth. And being able to see the progression from zero to 300 meters is something that a lot of Seychellois who participated um, will never forget. Um, the blue economy, which defined by the Seychelles government, is uh, usage, sustainable usage of our marine resources um, and to preserve the natural ecosystem, but also to make sure that the wealth that we get from these activities are shared equitably. Um, for the moment, we um, have activities in the fisheries and the tourism sector. We are also venturing in the aquaculture. But for the future, we are ende endeavoring um, to um, start a biotech um, sector uh, industry. And we are also um, thinking of marine renew renewables. Um, there is also potential for marine science to be more developed and also better data management uh, opportunities. Yeah. I can tell you what economic activities should not be included in the blue economy. We should not have industrial fisheries like we do now because that's unsustainable, it's proven. We should not have oil and gas because that's fossil fuel extraction that leads to climate change. We should not have any industry that does not lead us to a low carbon economy and to a more sustainable and equitable society. So that's what we must not have. Anything else is okay. So this is where we must go. That's our trajectory. Well, deep sea extraction is something that's a conundrum because if you look at what people are talking about right now when they mean deep sea extraction, it's about polymetallic nodules. And we know that China and India are active in the Indian Ocean looking for these. But for us in the Seychelles and perhaps many of the small island states, it's really so far off, it's like a mirage. I think deep sea mining does affect all of us um, because we don't know what is below our oceans. We know more probably, we know more about space probably than we, knew when, than we do about our own oceans, right? Especially below 200 meters. So what happens down there may affect us all in future, but we don't know that yet. Um, giving a Seychelles context, um, there are probably more prominent issues that we are faced with, such as overfishing or climate, global climate change. Um, so it's not perhaps the biggest focus here, just because we're not affected by it um, on our day-to-day -day lives. Um, but I think we should all take an interest in what deep sea mining means to the world. Seychelles does not currently have a position on deep seabed mining, um, but we do have um, involvement in that area. In, 1980, when in 1983, we did allow an Indian survey to come and do a survey for polymetallic nodules in our waters, our EZ. And also we joined the International Seabed Authority in 1994 and since then, we have had some participation here and there, but we haven't been actively um, been present. The International Seabed Authority has the mandate to um, manage and control the activities that happens in the areas beyond national jurisdictions, which is what we call the area or the high seas. And they do this through um, management of capacity building. Um, they give out contracts to countries who wants to do research in the area. At the moment, there is no actual mining activities. There's only research. At the moment, the Seychelles involvement in the international seabed, deep seabed mining activities is very minimal, but there are there are activities in areas which is close to Seychelles. As you know, Seychelles jointly manages an area of about 496,000 square kilometers with Mauritius. Um, and there is an area which is contracted out to about six different countries, which is east to that area. So we are keeping a close eye on it. 
So now we know that a huge area, almost the, almost the entirety of the Seychelles EZ has been leased out in blocks to petroleum um, exploration companies. So you have this huge area that's potentially there for petroleum extraction if they find these deposits that can be commercially exploited. We also see the joint management area of the extended continental shelf between Mauritius and Seychelles where basically their main interest is oil. So what is happening here is this is very imminent. This could happen at any time. And yes, we have a Petroleum Mining Act. We have some institutions here, okay? We have very recently the World Bank has putting um, the Extractive Industries Transparency Initiative. But on the environmental and sustainable development side, we have very little. We don't have the capacity, we don't have the expertise, we don't even have the protocols for any of this. And we can see even in a larger country like Mauritius, what happened when there was an oil spill from a bulk carrier. There was actually chaos. And nobody has been able to tell anybody what has happened and what are the impacts. It's difficult to comprehend the effects that it will have on Seychelles' blue economy. Like I said, it's we don't know a lot about the effects. Um, the information is still coming in. In fact, there's a lot of papers that have just been published this year um, explaining that deep sea mining might have an effect on locations and islands far away from where minerals are being mined. Within the Seychelles context, again, that's hard to understand. But what we do know is that there's still a lot to discover below uh, 200 meters. We still know that there, there might be um, a coral with some special enzyme that might hold the secrets of the cure for cancer. There might be species that are important for regulation of temperature or you know, absorption of carbon. We just don't know. And generally the best thing to do is to do more research and to take the precautionary approach. Um, as opposed to diving into an industry where we might have extremely long-term effects and we, yeah, we just give in. So we don't know much. We don't know much. Again, as, um, as I've said, we know much more about the petroleum, um, the, 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 the oil and gas deposits here. Okay, there's been a lot of work done. So there's quite a lot of knowledge of the geology and so forth. We don't know much about what nodules or polymetallic um, deposits are around here. We don't even know where these hydrothermal vents are, whether they're extinct or whether they are, they are, they are still active. So that's the first step, is that knowledge. We don't have knowledge of it. So where are these things? So we must be able to gain much more information and much more knowledge of where these deposits are. Secondly, we know that India and China are actively looking since 2018 for these deposits. So they're already in the Indian Ocean. They haven't expressed any interest in coming to the Seychelles EZ. So perhaps we don't have these nodules even here. We don't know. I think the first step for anybody is for the government of Seychelles to link up with some foreign organization or some international organization to try and see if we do have these deposits. So I think when we talk about the blue economy, it cannot be new wine in an old bottle. It can't be just slapping a label on something that's business as usual. So we must look really for out of the box solutions for something very different from where we are today. Seychelles' blue economy depends on a natural environment that is pristine and healthy. The two economic pillars of this country, 
of tourism and fisheries. For them to stay in a state that keeps on giving, they need to be able to provide for not only a local population, but also international visitors. Deep sea bed mining presents an attractive option for government that wants to continue to grow. But like fossil fuel extraction presents severe threats to our national economy and way of life, as well as natural environment. Thus, they cannot be considered sustainable or even equitable. Something like deep sea bed mining, when we know nothing about the deep sea, is tragic as it is stupid. As a country, we must speak about what happens inside our ocean territory as well as outside of our ocean territory. At the International Seabed Authority's meeting, we must tell the world that Seychelles does not know enough and the rest of the world does not know enough to make this decision. Our call is to wait and it's to research and learn more. We want to support a moratorium that takes 10 years of time to understand our ocean and then make informed decision about what is possible for our countries as well as others. If we rush into something like this, the consequences may be too much for our culture, for our lifestyle, for our natural environment, and we'll pay a price we cannot afford. Thank you so much for watching, and I look forward to you joining this campaign. Te tutoni o kitato no te turono o te aorangi. Ki ako no tante to tato aorangi. E ara roto i te moana aro te te tai. Te kite ni tato i te mana mana tau tau i angarewa. Te iti ni i tika. I roto i te moana. Te mati ni i te akau. I iti i tua tau. Kareo tato tika anga. I te rawe aku otu anga, i te teiho anga anga te kariro mai I tamana mana tā i tō tātō mōna Companies interested in exploring the Cook Islands for seabed minerals met today with the government agencies and NGOs There could be an early sitting of parliament next year as the government tries to pass the seabed minerals bill A Cook Islands marine scientific team departed Rotonga this morning on the local vessel Greta for a two-week survey of the manganese nodules in the Cook Islands exclusive economic zone Ocean Minerals Limited has acquired a reserve area and recently received a research permit to conduct some sampling in the area The Seabed Minerals Authority officially launched the opening of licenses to explore the polymetallic minerals in the Cook Islands EEZ. It is my great pleasure as the Minister for Seabed Minerals to open the licensing process for exploration licensing in our Cook Islands waters. The Cook Island Seabed Minerals Authority is the lead agency tasked with regulating seabed minerals activity that falls under the jurisdiction of the Cook Islands. The authority was established back in 2013. Currently we have released the draft um, seabed minerals mining regulations and they're currently out for comment. Um, the closing period for comments will be January of 2021. The intent or the goal of exploration is to gain more data, therefore gain more information on the deep sea environment, what's out there, um, what can we learn about what's out there and of course um, if we were to proceed with I guess the recovery phase which would be the next phase after exploration, 
um, can this be done in an environmentally and socially acceptable way. This park that we established, it took about seven years um, to go through consultations with the communities, find out what they thought about it, um, negotiate between government departments and between government departments and NGOs um, and traditional leaders, what the marine protected area should look like. And finally, everybody came up with this um, multiple use marine park where there'd be marine spatial planning. Um, so that's areas where you can set aside for conservation and areas where you can sustainably harvest resources. Part of my job was to help the government to find ways to mine in a way that's not going to impact the marine protected area we'd just established. That's Marae Moana. Aside from a few individuals inside government, most of the world, the rest of the world, thinks how can you possibly mine inside a marine protected area and still call it a marine protected area. I understand there is exploration, I think it's just a matter of time of uh when does it transform from exploration to exploitation? I think it's too soon, to be honest. I think there's still so much that isn't known and we even, as a country, haven't got, you know, that the environmental regulations are still in their draft form for seabed minerals activities. So these companies who are putting in bids don't even know what our regulations are going to be in their final form yet. Um, and don't know if they can adhere to our regulations. So I think that's that's one of the ways we're moving too fast. We should really have got all our regulations in place before opening up for exploration. A lot of people are concerned about how fast it's going. Um, and especially as a young one, it's kind of like, I'm still gonna be here like 20, 30, 40 years. What's it gonna be like then? Like we expect there to be more research before any actual action is happening. So with the exploration um, licenses being launched, we hope that that exploration process um, isn't just exploration, yet yeah, happy, straight bang into the mining. The Marae Moana, which is our marine park, which is the whole of the Cook Islands exclusive economic zone, um, we haven't finished the marine spatial planning for that yet, so I think that's, that's something that really should be done before exploration, if, before we even look at licensing exploratory um, activities. It, because it takes a long time to gather information about the biodiversity of the deep ocean, really it takes years to study species and their biology and uh, to determine what species are there that could um, be useful to us in some other way, such as in um, helping us to find cures for cancer or um, cures for diabetes or um, designing some sort of technology, you know, we can learn all of these things from the life that lives in the deep ocean. I'd expect it to be a long time, even just doing my work, which, are, you know, similar fields have taken a lot of time to do what I'm doing. And so even just the planning stage can take a long time. And then you've got the field work itself, uh, which can take a long time. And then you've got to analyse it, which can take a long time. The scientists have warned us that um, the impacts of seabed mining will be irreversible. Um, and so with information like that, we really have to ask ourselves the question, are we going to be OK with not being able to undo these impacts? Are we really OK with that? Feeling empowered to be able to speak out, um, be, to be able to ask questions, because we have, I think, culturally we have, we have such a respect for authority, which is, you know, is, is a good thing, but at the same time, people, we need to remember, because I do this too, we need to remember that actually our MPs 
and our people in government are people that we have put there. They are public servants. Literally, the definition of that is to serve the public. It might seem like you're speaking out against authority, you're speaking out against your government, which isn't the case. I think it's very healthy to be able to ask questions, have them answered. I think people just need to ask themselves um, if they've ever been in a situation where uh, they decided that they wouldn't say anything publicly because they were concerned about how that would affect their job. Uh, and if the answer is yes, um, then it means that our laws aren't sufficient to protect our free speech in the country. We call on Pacific leaders to join the growing rank of governments, scientific authorities, civil society, and global leaders and indigenous groups all over the world, opposing the rush to mine the ocean floor, and in doing so, destroy our common heritage. I think um, COVID-19 has clearly established within the Cook Islands the need to consider other opportunities where income can be generated. But in saying that, I think it's really, really important that we take heed and be cautious about how we manage seabed minerals mining and what does that mean for the community and for the longer term sustainability of our lagoons and um, our marine environment. I'm not against mining. I'm not against uh, us making use of these, um, you know, basically gift uh, from nature, from God for us. But I think is there's an obligation for us not to sleep walk into this sort of thing. There is a real danger we're going to be eaten alive by top-notch negotiators. I don't think it will do anything much at all. It'll do a lot for other countries, but not for us. But we have been told as a nation that there's economic benefits, there's economic gains coming from such an industry like seabed mining. But I guess there's lots of questions um, and uncertainties around how this financial gain will be managed and how much of that money will actually trickle down to the people. So until we can get some sort of confirmation, uh, confirmation or guarantee that there really is some economic benefits around this, um, it's really something we need um, to be more alert about. The, the way the, the governments have been trying to um, bring in new ideas and, and I think the new ideas are good to a certain extent, but not all the time. Yaku e me pūpinga ki a ki a tuku o tūtato i te anganga, ki a roa tu te tuato, e rāwinga no te akatapa pa mita ki anga i a tato, e te akamatu tu anga i tato o tamariki, ki a riro mai, nā rātou e rawe i te anganga. Just keep in mind, these people that we're going to give the rights to, to, to dig the thing, to, to harvest it, they are billionaires and billionaires, and they have an army. They have the army to back them up to make their decisions. Now, we have to be careful. We have to... Now we have the mana to hold them. Once they get in, we can't stop them. We can't say, oh, that's not what was agreed. Too late. They're in the door. Too late. Well, the problem is you make a mistake and you lost it all. It, you know, you're not going to get those minerals replaced. Once it's gone, it's gone. So we, you have one go at this, you've got to get it right at the beginning. We need to prepare our people how to manage, uh, you know, how to manage this benefit. Yeah, we know our weakness, we're terrible with money. So let's change that around. Let's have our people be good with money. Train them all so that when we get this benefit, we know how to handle it. I think all we're going to get is money that melts. Money doesn't last. 
te wai nei te tai o tūranga, te ka ano ano e tato te ititanga te kia mara mata to e ke kite tato e e a te o pinga e re te ka tupu girunga i to tato oranga to te tanga ta e pera kato te oranga o to tato enua e pera kato i te moana. If we are going to do it, and that's a big like if we are, we should take as much care and do as much research as possible. Find out, you know, do the research first and then find out that everything's great rather than just jumping into it and then finding out that everything's so wrong. Let's wait another 20 years. Let's do this right. Let's do this right. I can't see us getting the best out of this sector if we, as we the Kualans people, are not as involved in it as we can be and we're not getting the best out of it. No one knows that much information about seabed mining in general and what that looks like for the islands. You have to actually get people to explain it to you, you have to go to things and ask questions. And for an average Cook Islander who's busy or maybe doesn't actually have that much interest and is doing other things, they're not going to have the time to go and find this out. And they should. It should be kind of like, it should be like politics, it should be like daily news. If this is a sector that we are going to consider going into, or we are considering going into and we're trying to move ahead with, every member of the Kylans community needs to be aware of it. I know a little of the seabed mining, but I understand from my Bible point of view, I should not be disturbing the ocean floor. Some of our people to a degree are informed, but when we come down to the community level, there's not really uh, understanding, I'd say. Uh, people know what seabed mining is, but they don't understand how it works and uh, what the uh, problems of it are. The people want to know more. They don't just want it to happen. They want more information before anything is actually happening. These resources don't belong to one person. They belong to all of us, and we should all have a say, an opinion, and just we should all be informed and aware and be made aware of what this process actually means for us. I think the rationale behind the, the moratorium, which is being called for a minimum 10-year moratorium, the rationale is that there's not enough um, scientific information on what the impacts are going to be, the extent of the impacts, their likelihood, we don't know enough about the deep sea in general to be able to, to say what the impacts are going to be. I understand there's like a 10 year moratorium going on. Um, I don't know if that's long enough, but I don't know. Uh, but then also when you get that information, being transparent about it, eh? um, I think transparency is key, uh, rather than just showing the um, what the people need to see or want, oh, well, want to see. In order to have the information to make management decisions, a 10-year moratorium is the minimum that you would need to, um, to learn about the, the deep ocean and adequately protect the environment from uh, mining. There's a lot of ifs. I know this sounds all very uncertain. <laughs> Um, but that's the nature of, of deep sea mining right now. Everything is so uncertain. There's really, the technology is very uncertain. The impacts are uncertain, both social and environmental. So much uncertainty and that's really the driving force behind asking for more time. Okay, hi everyone coming in. Um, my name is Eva Raymond. I'm going to be the moderator of the session. We're just going to give everyone about a minute to get in from the main stage and then we'll get going. So please just sit tight. Everyone who's just joining us, we're just waiting a minute or so to let everyone in. Thank you so much, and we're going to begin quite soon.
Okay, we've still got people coming into the room, but, um, oh, yep. Okay, we'll give, we'll give everyone about 20 more seconds. Suddenly numbers are skyrocketing. <laughs> Okay, great. So as everyone's when entering, you know, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone who's watching. My name is Diva Amon and I'm a deep sea biologist and I'll be moderating today's session. And we've just seen some incredibly compelling and really beautiful videos from the Seychelles and the Cook Islands. And today we are, as part of this panel, we are lucky enough to be joined by two incredible and inspirational people who you'll recognize from those videos. So firstly, we have Alana Smith, who is the Senior Conservation Program Manager for the Te Ipukara Kareya, sorry, nearly, nearly, um, Society in the Cook Islands. And then we've also got Jeremy Ragaf, who is the Communications and Outreach Coordinator at the Seychelles Islands Foundation and a member of the Sustainable Ocean Alliance Youth Policy Advisory Council. So before we jump into what's hopefully going to be a really engaging discussion today, um, I wanted to remind everyone who's joining us that really this is very much a discussion and we want you guys to be involved as well. So please do, um, if you have questions about the videos you've just seen or just in general, you know, deep sea bed mining or anything ocean related that you'd like to throw at Jeremy and Alana, please do put your questions into the chat box on the right. Um, and if you want to address them to somebody in particular, please do sort of tag them and then I'll pick up on them. And so we're gonna we're gonna start off the chat and um, we're gonna be keep keep referring to that chat box to pull your questions as they're coming in. So please do send your questions in. So with that, um, let's get going. Hi Jeremy. Hi Alana. Hello. Hi Diva. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I wanted to start off with um, with quite a personal question, I guess. Um, really, how has growing up on an island affected the way that you think about the ocean, your relationship with the ocean? Um, how has that led you to where you are today and that we're sitting in this, this discussion? Who wants, Jeremy, you wanna kick it off? Sure, thanks for that. I mean, it's everywhere, right? You can't look out your window or go on a walk without seeing the blue. So, I mean, for my sake, uh, you know, the ocean's been a place of play. It's been a place of exploration, uh, food. Um, you know, most of what you do is, is right there. Uh, it's blue, it's in front of you. And I think for me, I remember the first day I went snorkeling, the first day I went fishing and how that was really, really part of uh, my, you know, taking things for granted. And only when I left Seychelles to go study in South Africa and was, far away, you know, for, for extended period of time that I really miss the sound of the waves or anything like that. So it's been a big part. And yeah, my current work now, if I hadn't had the chance to go and work on a UNESCO World Heritage Site, a Marine World Heritage Site, to see the kind of animals, the kind of life of, of being on a whole remote island, it, I would not have taken this course. So fundamental and uh, yeah, taken for granted, but no more. Absolutely. Alana? Yeah, I guess when you, if you look, if you want to look at the worldwide map and you try to find the Cook Islands, we're literally in the middle of the South Pacific Ocean it, and you can't even really see the island itself. It's just surrounded by blue ocean. Um, so as Jeremy had said, it's, the ocean is like a life source for us Pacific Islanders. Um, I don't think I've met a Pacific Islander that does, is not, does not like seafood. So we really, <laughs> really rely on um, our ocean for multiple things um, yeah and what do you think has sort of propelled you both I know obviously it's that it's that really personal relationship with the ocean and and surrounded by it throughout your lives but what do you think has sort of propelled you as Ashley has asked in the in the chat into this sort of environmental advocacy and justice almost work that you know we're here discussing today I guess for me, um, I've been able to see quite a few changes in our marine environment for once, like from my younger days compared to now. And um, I guess the changes haven't been for the better. And so me wanting to find out why those changes are happening and how I can 
be a part of some of the solutions or, or, or help improve um, that environment was probably the, the key thing for me. Yeah, mm. Jeremy? Yeah, definitely in, in my lifetime, you know, it's only been 20 odd years and whether it's hotels being built, seeing reclamation of land into the ocean, uh, it, it's changed, you know, so much that you, you can't help but think what's going to happen in the next 10 years, what's going to happen in the next 20 years and where am I going to fit into all that? So you can't just sit idly by while everything changes. And for me, yeah, the kind of work I'm doing right now with the communications, it's really about inviting people, not just in Seychelles, but outside of Seychelles to take part in this. Because I think as a small island in the middle of the ocean, you feel remote from things, whether it's climate change, marine plastic pollution, now we're talking about deep sea bed mining. It, it, it's linked to us and what we do on the island has its impact, but also what happens elsewhere really affects us too. Yeah, absolutely. And so, I mean, obviously we're here to talk about deep sea bed mining um, and how it could potentially impact each of your nations as well as, you know, the broader, broader world. But something that I was left wanting to know after watching the videos was, you know, what, what are your, yeah, your personal biggest concerns about deep sea bed mining, whether it is for you personally or for your island nation? Mm. I think for me personally, there's just currently so many uncertainties associated around seabed mining, um, right from the potential impacts that would have to the economic side of things as well. What's yeah. to say we will receive these economic benefits that everyone has been talking about? Who will really win from an industry such as this? Um, so, you know, we we this we still need more time we still need more time to get all this information collect all this data to make um a more responsible decision on um such an uncertain venture such as this mm. yeah um you know it's funny and basically in my first experience of working with so was attending our ocean um youth side of things and i had basically signed up to basically uh deep sea bed mining thinking was all about oil and gas exploration and my ignorance at that point about the subject actually terrified me once i realized that 1.5 uh, you know million square kilometers more than the ocean of seychelles had been licensed out to this you know these unknown entities through this other big unknown entity international seabed authority i was like whoa i'm meant to be in the ocean i'm meant to be following mm -hmm. I'm so it's all happening uh, and so much to catch up with. And then you start hearing about, you know, these particular, you know, areas that have been mined, they might be, a, you know, a small, it's like it's a relatively small part of the ocean, but the plumes that are being created, the kind of life that yeah. has never been seen there, nobody's down there. So you think about on a surface level, the amount of damage that's been done, and we can see it to not just, you know, uh, natural ways of life but but also human ways of life and mm. the kind of ecological services that we we're, we're not getting from the terrestrial uh ecosystems you know you think about that uh, at the deep sea where nobody will ever see it where we, we we just can't go as everyday people and that's absolutely terrifying so that we destroy life and destroy things that we we don't even know we need uh you know with machines and everything that's going for I don't know. It's going for decades potentially and producing so much um, sediment that just when we talk about ocean currents, all these other things, it can just end up from one part of the world to a whole other part of the world. And, and that's terrifying. Yeah, you hit on a really interesting point there in that, you know, sure, it's most of the world doesn't even know about the concept of deep sea bed mining. But I think it's we could take a step back from that and say that actually most of the world doesn't even really think about the deep ocean at all, despite the fact that it's the largest ecosystem on the planet, despite the fact that it's super important to making sure the you know, the, the earth is habitable. Um, and, and that's quite scary. And that's something that, I mean, I think all of us can identify with, even though we've come from island nations, the deep sea was still just not part of our everyday lives. Would you say that was the case for you guys before sort of more engagement started? I guess it has um, similar lines to climate change as well. I, and being in the small island states, we are very much aware about what is going on, the changes that we've um, also, we're recognizing all of this. And yeah, you have the big islands that, big nations that don't even see this at the same pace. So 
Yeah, it is definitely scary. And if it's going to be going along the same lines as what climate change is, then it's definitely a scary thought. Yeah, yeah, I did, I did on that. I mean, just the other day, I was with a group of children, about 25 of, of them, just going snorkeling. This was the first time they ever went snorkeling. So, mm. you know, touching what Sheena said in terms of, you know, as a, as a government or as a country, there has been strides to, to go out there and, and do research, but at a scuba level, uh, but it's so prohibitive when you talk about, you know, something below 200 meters for such a small, small uh, country, right, dot in the ocean. So I think we, we, we still need a lot to even just get our people uh, to be fully in, engaged in water in terms of, you know, exploring it. I mean, this, we are very dependent on fisheries and we go out for fishing, but to really go underwater and go to that depth, uh, it's only recently last year that we had such a big, uh, you know, outreach and scientific uh, mission with, with the Necton Foundation. So yeah. it's only recently for us, yeah. And I think Seychelles has had like a really remarkable um, opportunity to work with Necton. And that's not an opportunity that most island states will have or have had or will have in the near future. And so, you know, getting those stakeholders engaged is hard to do without, um, without things grounded in like having that imagery, right? Um, so I was gonna ask you, Alana, throughout your video, um, the Cook's video, there was so much emphasis on stakeholder engagement and how important that needs to be. And so I wanted to know whether you had any additional thoughts on that or whether you had any, you know, hot tips for that. Like it's, it is something that's often overlooked, especially with the deep ocean. Definitely. And I think to have as good of engagement as possible, you need a systematic approach to it. You need to be constantly having a dialogue on this amongst the different stakeholders. And with that being said, here in the Cook Islands, there's specific, specific stakeholders that we do need to target because they have a really big influence on the people that trickle down below them. Um, for example, in our outer islands, our churches and our aronga mana, their traditional leaders, they're the ones that really influence the people in our outer islands. So more of um, more dialogue mm. needs to be have with, have with them. And when we have that dialogue, it needs to be a balanced dialogue. So showing two sides to the story, um, what the benefits are, but of course, what the potential impacts are as well. So these people can make informed decisions, have a balanced um opinion of yeah. uh, of the issue at hand jeremy anything you want to add there if not there's loads of questions coming in <laughs> no i think i think alana's captured it. and i think when we talk about stakeholders in seychelles um specifically deep sea med it's not something on our on our doorstep as such yeah but you know when we look outside of our just on our borders you know there's interest from from china from india within the joint maritime area of mauritius so right now it's kind of within the government sphere kind of in some of the conservationist groups that I mean, as we heard from Dr. Shah, it is on people's radar, but there's a lot of, you know, other other issues that are also on our radar firstly. Uh, and it's interesting to see how they're related in some ways, because when we talk about the transparency of, of government in these things and accessibility to information, this is how do you get people in Seychelles or, you know, outside of Seychelles to, 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 to take note of this. It's not easy. Absolutely. Um, so, so still on the topic of stakeholder engagement, I mean, like the Cook's video, I thought was just this emotional roller coaster, and um, and the Seychelles video is incredibly motivating. I mean, they were both really compelling videos, and so um, April's asked whether there are any, you know, uh, sort of ideas or plans in the pipelines to share these videos with you know, a broader stakeholder group, whether it's government or um, other areas, other other folks. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's uh, going to be another event uh, in Seychelles, uh, based in Seychelles, and we'll, we'll be streaming it live. And thanks to SOA for supporting uh, me in this. But basically, with government, with other national stakeholders, uh, having a panel discussion. And I'm hoping this video will be part of that in terms of giving people a bit of ground in uh, and just start in a dialogue because I think the dialogue is still to be had and we are, you know, implications wise, still really uh, trying to get on. So I think the government Seychelles is an active uh, participant usually. And I think it's a case mm -hmm. of justifying and prioritizing these things in, a, in the context of COVID, 
where you know tourism's uh, you know uh, at its lowest level in, in in decades. You know the blue economy promises everything, but yeah. you know we need to know what a blue economy is and what it what it isn't. And as as the people in the room uh, early, it, we don't get to make the decisions before everybody has entered the room. So so that's that's kind of why I'm seeing it. So I mean yeah, through 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 this work, it's definitely planned. Great. And actually, you've sort of like brought us into this topic yeah. of this broader topic of the blue economy. And I think often we, you know, um, advocates for deep sea bed mining will say that it's that it is a part of the blue economy. But if we look at the World Bank definition of what the blue economy means, it's the sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, improved livelihoods and jobs and ocean ecosystem health. And, you know, when you look it up in other places, it says it goes beyond viewing that ocean economy solely as a mechanism for economic growth. And it aims for improvement of human well-being, social equity, while, you know, most importantly, reducing environmental risks and ecological scarcities. So it, in your opinion, do you think that, um, you know, I think there are elements of uh arguments used for seabed mining that that can fit into this this definition but but obviously elements that clearly don't so what are your thoughts i guess um when i think about the blue economy i feel like there's probably not enough information right now that to say we can 100 percent support um, that idea of seabed mining fitting into the realm mm -hmm. of a, a blue economy. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's a bit, yeah, it's too premature to, to have a say on it right now um, until we really get more data and more information on yeah, this area. Yeah, totally agreed. Um, you know, we've got this ocean decade of science for sustainable development. And the last thing we want a blue economy to be is, is blue washing, you know, uh, as it's been said yeah. to be this, this uh, new label on old wine uh there's precedent okay. there's really good precedent in 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 both our cases i believe with with fisheries when we look at certain uh practices that happen and the kind of you know externalities if we can't even ensure that current fisheries are sustainable uh and when i mean sustainable you know the 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 the, the, the profits the the revenues being done in e equitably and yeah. the, the the most amount of mitigations are happening and the kind of research going in to make sure this stuff happens if that's not being done on pre-existing blue economy industries you can't run to an, and and start making a whole new one without fixing those problems without basically going to that so i think looking at fisheries looking at other things that have been established in the blue economy and seeing the issues there and seeing how they would be repeated or worsened in in you know in new ventures be it deep sea bed mine and oil gas exploration and these things are in many cases very climate uh damaging yeah um you know and i think the promise of these these metals going into um re renewable energy future it's 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 very much it's a too simple to to just put it out that way because we know we might be hurting ourselves and yeah. hurting our resilience uh trying to fix something yeah and i think you know something we haven't really spoken about is the potential for um the, fi the fisheries that that both of your islands and many Pacific and many just island nations in general rely on, on the fact that there are very real concerns. Um, again, more evidence is needed, but there are very real concerns that potentially there could be a lot of metals and um, entering into the food chain and, and that could potentially have a have a really devastating um, impact on yeah, island nations. Do you think that's a, a major concern? Um, yeah, definitely for me. Like I said, I haven't met a Pacific Islander that <laughs> doesn't like seafood. Um, seafood is one of our, our key sources of, of food. So if that was going to affect um, that source, then that would have devastating impacts um, for us here in the Pacific Islands, not just the Cook Islands, but the Pacific Island as a whole. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, just adding on to that, I think when you look at, you know, the situation, I find myself on the same team as, as industrial fishers, which is kind of crazy to me, right? It's, uh, it makes for strange bedfellows. And you see uh, within the European Parliament, you know, so the European uh, tuna per se is are very active in the region in Seychelles, right. huge economic driver for us, very critical for our economy. Um, but at the same time, they are afraid 
of you know the implications of zip these zip bed mining. So when we when they are afraid, what does that mean for the rest of us? What does that mean for those who don't have the kind of lobbying that they have in that sense? So I mean that's that's already a red flag for me. And yeah. I think when we look at it again, it's okay. What can happen in our in our territory is somewhat controlled and obviously somewhat of what we need to to figure out as a, as a, as a people. But what happens outside of the territory? And when we think about uh, biodiversity beyond our jurisdictions, when we think about all these migratory species, um, if somebody decides in the high seas to basically take something or you know, do something, that can impact us. And yeah. we have have some say in that, but yeah, it's scary. I think it's, it's really important to note, and what I keep hearing from both of you and throughout the videos was that, you know, we're not, no one is saying no forever, right? Like it's, both videos were absolutely advocating for, you know, more time to get that research, to absolutely exercise that precaution, the precautionary approach. Like that's what needs to be taken and there needs to be time for research. And I thought in the, in the Cook Islands video, it was really poignant that, um, you know, someone was saying that they didn't think that they were like, yeah, 10 years is a great start through the decade to allow that um, that a lot of that cr critical research to be gathered. But then they went on to say that actually like 10 years probably wouldn't be enough, but hey, it's great to start with something, right? Um, and so I wanted, I just was wondering whether you had um, anything more to add really about why that precaution was so important to both of your nations? I guess from the Cook Islands point of view, having just more data, more information, just to have a make more informed decisions for ourselves. And you never know, maybe in 10 years time, the, the, the costs for these minerals might evaporate. Maybe we've found, found some other solution and we don't even need these minerals in the first place. So that time allows not just for that, but for changes in how we're currently living um, our lifestyles today. Um, technology might have improved yeah. within 10 years, hopefully 10 years to, to properly, properly pick, pluck whatever, all these um, nodules out of the, the ground. Um, the time, just time is just this buffer just to allow for these potential yeah, other factors absolutely. that could happen. Yeah, 100% agree with that. And I think, you know, when we talk about uh, my background, is a bit in plastic pollution. And you see what we talk about of circular economies, you see certain investments like Redwood, um, you know, in, in the sense of what kind of revolution can happen in that time terrestrially so that we really don't need to go there. 10 years could be enough to really start getting us you know, in, in, I mean us, I mean those who've, who now are on a laptop, now we have our phones, to mm -hmm. really start questioning where these metals come from, where yeah. these different precious materials, I think that can happen in 10 years. And I think hopefully industry and other, you know, governments make it harder to, to just act without knowing. And I think the best thing is, uh, I think what Nayona was saying about 8 billion people, 500 decisions, good decisions. I think it's about informed decisions. Yeah. If, if people are able to have informed decisions, um, we are going to get somewhere. And I think, as he was saying again, access to the information, this changes everything, I think. So I'm hoping from those who are listening, if two more people hear about it or one more articles read, like uh, the Greenpeace's uh, recent uh, report that The Guardian also has an article, just realizing yeah inequity of the companies there, uh, you know, should, should get people roused and, and interested in this. Yeah, definitely. Um, so kind of moving on from that is, is that I probably the most occurring, constantly occurring question in the chat is what can like anyone engage, anyone, whether it's youth or otherwise, who wants to engage in this, what would be your advice to them and how they can engage in this further? I think just to say, I mean, we're on social media and, and just to say, Diva, you do have an amazing Instagram. Oh, and, other social <laughs> and I think just appreciating the beauty of the deep sea. And I think just 
seeing what species are there. I think one of the things I've noticed about nature and, and environment is about, you won't care about something if you don't know it, if you don't appreciate it. So I think just seeing what's out there to begin with through what Schmidt's doing, through other participants in this call are doing is, is really like visualizing and seeing, okay, that is a beautiful creature I've never seen before. And it could be gone uh, before I even, you know, get to know it or anything. So I think, yeah, uh, exposing yourself to this visually. And then hopefully I think that's going to incite you to read more, interact with more as the first step. And I think the same way people are questioning what goes into their bodies, you know, in terms of food mm -hmm. or what the carbon is, I think it's about asking where we can to see, okay, you know, where's our electronics coming from? Are we maybe looking into Fairphone or other initiatives that are really beginning to take these things? Are we interested in recycling, uh, you know, e-waste e recycling in that sense? Yeah. So I think those are things, and I think so it's information and individual choices, but really it's going to then come back to asking your governments, asking the bigger players, what are they doing? Are they aware of this? Yeah, hundred percent agree with Jeremy. I think it's great having champions like yourself, Diva, or, um, you. to follow and get an Obviously. insight. Obviously. <laughs> oh my gosh, but no, you're, the footage, the footage you share on your Instagram page is just amazing. And it's just mind blowing to see what life is actually down there. And just little things like that really does get the youth interested in such an area like this. Um, but that's the whole, that's the whole name of the game. We've got to get our youth, our young ones interested, hooked into the subject so they can start this constant dialogue on a day-to-day -day basis. Maybe we have a TikTok <laughs> competition or something on seabed mining. I mean, anything just to get us um, hooked and talking about this topic. So a couple of things uh, right yeah. to that. So in terms of like Instagram, social, just websites, if people want to know more, I mean, and get more great imagery, some great places to start are NOAA's Office of Ocean Exploration and Research. They have an amazing Twitter. So does Schmidt, who we just saw like fantastic goosebump raising imagery from. Um, the Nautilus Ocean Exploration Trust, those are three of the main ships who just do absolutely incredible work. There are lots of great deep sea scientists out there. There are lots of organizations as well, like the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, who share a lot of great content. So please, if you're on social media, do try to just immerse yourself in um, deep sea content. But I was going to ask, you know, definitely, Alana, I think, you know, I think we are going to see change generationally. And I guess the worry is like, do we have time to allow that to happen, right? Um, but Emma was asking whether, it, um, Jeremy, you brought up the bottom down, bottom up control, sorry, bottom up efforts, which is obviously on the ground, and then top down, which is governments and corporate. And so Emma Hutchinson was asking whether you think there's an opportunity potentially for, um, as a solution, you know, international funding streams to incentivize governments in good behavior, not just the violent nations, but to whether there, there is a way to, to put the money on the table to say, hey, perhaps this is an alternative to deep sea bed mining and yeah, a substitute mm. in some way, shape or form. Do you think that's like something that can yeah, fly? If I can come in on yeah, if it can come in on that. I mean, we've just completed the first part of our marine spatial plan in terms of seeing where where we want to protect and you know that's 30 percent of our ez so the size of germany and you know i'm very lucky to work with with the no takes area of aldabra and you know what also the marine spatial plan has been able to do is is really allow us to uh get a better understanding of all the different information all the different research that's going on and and ask for further so we've got different zones saying okay this is no take sustainable use you know and then you know zone free what might happen in that and yeah. You know, we that was a debt uh, swap nature. We we basically managed to get better terms on our debt, and that that was a huge incentive for the government to not only um, be serious, but to really see how they can benefit, how our people can benefit from mm -hmm. protecting a uh, part of our ocean. So I think that's one interesting avenue that is being proven to work to, to incentivize our government to to know more and and do more. Now our real work begins in terms of enforcing these things of, of you know rebuking pressure for from certain areas i'm sure uh but i think in terms of if, if it's a case of us needing to know more international funding that allows 
uh, governments, NGOs, you know, to be in the ocean, to, to go out there and see, that's going to be critical. And then disincentivizing people from exploiting natural res resources such as these ones, it's going to be about telling them, okay, this is going to affect your tuna stocks. This is going to affect yeah. other things that are established there. And I think maybe, as in some cases, you can pay people to definitely close the box on things, but that is a, that is a very, that's a complicated avenue. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, but I do think we are seeing that the small, very small steps being taken to ensure that, um, you know, like financing is responsible for various, we are seeing that tide changing. It's just happening really slowly. But so Alana, I'm going to throw it to you now. Um, in terms of the cooks, are there any particular um, sort of either regulations that you want to see put in place before anything further, any exploitation were to happen? Or, or do you think there's any like huge big scientific questions that you want to, that you want, would like to have for you personally and your nation personally, uh, not personally, and your nation before exploitation begins? I mean, I think a, a key one that the world is currently looking at right now and questioning themselves is our marine spatial plan. We currently haven't completed that as of yet. So ideally that would be great if we would complete our marine spatial plan before any exploitation would occur. Um, identifying the SUMAs in our ocean as well. Um, we haven't quite gotten around to, to identifying those areas. Um, so I think those are the two key ones yeah. I would say for now um, that needs to be done before we can clearly go ahead yeah. in this area. And Jeremy, obviously, it's you know, the Seychelles is very really different to the Cooks. Cooks is con considering mining within their easy. The Seychelles is more concerned with areas outside of their easy, but that could still have impacts. Are there any particular policies or um, science, you know, scientific questions answered that you want to see happen before? exploitation is taking place in international waters sure. i think i think the first thing is connectivity I mean, again just looking at the very surface level with plastic i've seen plastic move within the indian ocean uh, thousands and thousands of miles yeah. um so what can happen on below the sea surface is, is is unknown to us so that's that's one thing research that really understands that and i'm seeing from the chat anna uh, Tierra saying no mining company research. I mean, how do we ensure our research is independent? I've seen this with uh, other industries, fishing in the sense of how do you basically ensure that your science has integrity and is is actually able to inform us rather than you know uh, you know be propaganda. I would call it propaganda to some extent. Um, so so I think it's about independent research. And lastly, I mean, just the process. I mean, it'd be amazing if the International Seabed Authority had a discussion like this that we're having right now for the public. Because as I'm seeing, and again, reading from that Greenpeace report, um, the, 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 the closeness between companies and governments, the way they're able to sit on each other's uh, seats at these meetings, the way we are not necessarily seeing everything that's, that's going on, this process is not accountable it's not as transparent it's not as inclusive as it should be um so i think that process is is, is maybe being rushed for those reasons as yeah. well so yeah those are my thoughts on that i mean definitely i think it's something that should be considered potentially there's going to be a meeting at the isa in february i mean probably not given covid but there'll most likely be one in july and i think you know i'm constantly struck when attending those meetings at how how few youth voices there are in the room and i really do think that um potentially having you know it's it is ultimately this area is the common heritage of humankind it's meant to benefit not just all of us on the call listening watching or, but also everyone on the planet and also everyone yet to come and so it is important that as you just said jeremy we do get that diversity of voices in the room in all respects and um, taking part in that conversation. Um, so the the last question, and I'm, I, we kind of touched on this one already, but I, I want to end on a positive note, um, is that, you know, given, given your experiences, whether it's through SOA or something more local, um, 
what do you think are some really uh, sort of important ways in which those watching can engage? And I don't just mean in terms of like, how can they actually engage in, in, in advocacy, right? Not just educating themselves. Of course, educating themselves is the first step. But how do you engage in in advocacy or or you know getting science policy or basically just being at that forefront of um, being able to contribute to the discussions? Sorry, last question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can go. I mean, I think uh, one one thing after this session, after people have a chance to to not only listen to us but the other speakers. I mean, if you do agree with what so is saying there we are taking uh, signatures for a petition. I mean, the petition is, is a very small step, but it does put your name down and it does give you that that stance. And I think that can be replicated uh, if you live in an island state or if you live in a country uh, that has, uh, you know, is, is basically going for island states to, deep sea, to do deep sea bed mining. I think the next step is to really go to the government officials that represent you to see what them, their state of knowledge are and what their stances are. Uh, I think it's going to be holding them accountable that is as key. Yep. Um, and after that, it's going to be a case of, you know, constant pressure. I, I think, you know, there's this so many different competing interests to, to stay on top of these days. But I think if we, we look at things holistically, if we see how everything's connected, uh, that'll help us keep constant pressure. Alana? I think, yeah, I think Germany, Germany hit the nail on the head just applying that pressure, that pressure to want to know more from our higher officials. Um, and, and then, as Jeremy mentioned, there's the, the petition that we have at the moment through the SOA um, with the Tenia moratorium, just understanding more about that. And if you agree, that's one way of sharing your voice um, at right. another level. Um, I think that's what I'd really like to close on, you know, sort of summarizing what you both just said is that ultimately, this should be a societal decision, right? And that means that all of us should be able to, to weigh in. And, um, and I don't think anyone should sort of forget that their voices can't be heard. And it is about applying that pressure to those who are making the decisions. Um, so with that, um, huge thanks. Like this has been an absolutely incredible discussion. Thank you to everyone who put their questions into the box. Thank you mostly to Alana and Jeremy for joining and, um, you know, just dealing with every question that's been thrown their way in an absolutely incredible, incredibly insightful and personal way. And um, of course, thank you to the Sustainable Ocean Alliance and the Oxygen Project for hosting not just this panel, but and giving a voice to island nations, but also for this incredible event that we're all part of today. Um, so to everyone that's still here, please join us for the Ocean Elders Intergenerational Conversation that's going to happen now. Um, Sylvia Earle, Sven Lembad and others are going to be there. So please do head over by clicking sessions on the left hand side of your screen for the next panel. And again, thank you, Jeremy and Alana. Thank you, Diva. <laughs> awesome. Thank you. See you guys. All right. Uh, welcome, everyone, uh, to the inter intergenerational panel discussion between youth and current thought leaders uh, around the campaign to defend the deep. I'm Rhett Butler from Manga Bay. Um, so far today, we've gotten some great context around the issue of deep seabed mining. And this will be an opportunity to have an interesting with, uh, a conversation with some really interesting folks. So I'm uh, pleased to introduce our esteemed panel. Um, Sylvia Earle is a marine, American marine biologist and author who has been a National Geographic explorer and resident since 1988, uh, was NOAA's first female chief scientist, uh, and is part of Ocean Elders. Um, Sven Lindblad is the founder and CEO of Lindblad Expeditions, uh, an innovative travel company offering small ship-based expeditions to the world's wildest and most charis uh, charismatic geographies. Um, and Sophie Rowe, sorry, Rue, uh, is a social scientist uh, who founded uh, NACA and serves as uh, the Sustainable Ocean Alliance's representative for France and Europe. And uh, Daniel um, Caceres, uh, 
Bartra is uh, a marine biologist who is the founder and executive director of the Sustainable Ocean Alliance Peru. Um, so thank you all for joining me. Um, to start off, uh, I'd like to hear from each of you on why you're working on deep seabed mining and what specific aspects of the issue you're focused on. So um, Sylvia, I'd like to start with you. My interest in deep sea mining goes way back to when I first heard about the existence of minerals in the deep sea, reading about the Challenger expedition, going fast forward to the 1970s, the late 70s, when it was thought that manganese nodules could be accessed from the deep sea as a great new source of riches. And moving on through the 80s, we got involved with some discussions about the reality with Lockheed Martin, very interested in using their technologies to go see what was in the deep sea. Uh, and other companies, they really invested hundreds of millions of dollars based on this, this image that they're just out there, let's go get them. And what could possibly go wrong? What could be harmed? And then the reality struck that it's difficult, it's expensive, the cost of going to the deep sea in the 80s and the technology that existed then was not sufficiently advanced to make it realistic. But then zoom forward again to the present time when technology does exist that makes it realistic to get to the deep sea but there's still some serious problems that haven't been addressed. And as somebody who has spent literally thousands of hours underwater and a lot of time in the deep ocean, I haven't been personally down where the deep, the manganese nodules are, but I have vicariously been there on expeditions with, with those from the University of Hawaii who've taken the deep ROV down and, and others as well, who have verified what, even going back to the 80s, they, they knew there were sea cucumbers, but they said they're just sea cucumbers. They knew there were sea anemones, uh, they're just sea anemones. They knew that there's a lot of life down there, but they thought it didn't matter, that the value of the minerals was worth more than the value of life. So anyway, my perspective over a long period of time has been understanding that what we're doing to the ocean, what we're taking out of it and what we're putting into it is changing the nature of the systems, basic earth systems, the systems that keep us alive, mostly ocean systems. And I've seen this happen to the ocean in my lifetime. We, we have the, the problems with deoxygenation, problems with loss of diversity. We, we're making the connection with climate and ocean, that the ocean really governs climate. I mean, whatever it is, we have to take care of the ocean. The ocean takes care of us. So I'm fiercely <laughs> concerned, I guess is the word, about further damage. I want to re repair the harm we've already done, restore health to the ocean, not tear it up even more, especially when we really don't have the answers about what's down there. Thanks, Sylvia. So, um, Daniel, you're much newer to this issue. Um, obviously, I'd you know, like to hear um, you know, how you got into it and, and what you're focused on. Well, first of all, all thank you, Sylvia, and, and thank you, Red, for the question and everyone in the panel. Well, Latin America, the region that I currently live, it's a place that has had sustainable development for hundreds and thousands of years. We've already known how to grow with satisfaction without having a big impact on our ecosystems, our wildlife, or other human beings. So right now, our region has changed in the past 200, 300 years, where the whole focus of the community standards have changed. And now it's all, instead of focusing on the individual, instead of focusing on our coexistence with nature, is now only focused on mercancy and consumism, consuming. 
So our region has also been very vulnerable to all these companies that need uh, Latin America just as fuel or just as rare raw resources and cheap labor to provide the rest of the world um, the demand that they need. In my country, Peru, for example, we don't have a single uh, legislative piece that protects the sea floors, the sea bottoms, and most of the countries in our regions don't. So we're very vulnerable to all these exploring uh, companies coming and deciding to exploit because they're going to be the ones that are going to put the first um, knowledge and the first extractive activities of this. And sadly, the focus and the point of view of our region is this is an opportunity, an economic opportunity to take us out of poverty instead of being seen as a terroristic act towards our ocean and towards the people here. So it's something that I'm very worried because I've seen it happening with the mining companies in all our Andes mountains and how they get defended and how they call people terrorists for defending their water, they get polluted and how they get taken to jail for protesting and blocking the roads when their sheep die or the cows die when it's, con it's contaminated. So I'm pretty sure the ocean mining is gonna be much, much worse. And we're, we're one of the first countries that depend on fisheries and artisanal fisheries. So if we young people don't take action on that, we're pretty sure that the other people won't do it. Uh, thanks, Daniel. So uh, Sven, you're coming from a different um, side from the private sector. So how, how did you get interested in, in this issue? Well, I, I'm not working on ocean mining uh, directly, uh, but at the, at the end of the day, we, we take 25 to 30,000 people traveling on, around the world on the oceans. And, uh, as far as I'm concerned, it's a really important opportunity to have a dialogue about what is the importance of a healthy ocean. Uh, we, we tend to weigh things in relationship in society, in relationship to their value when extracted, whether it's the fish, whether it's the oil, whether it's the minerals. Uh, and I think it's important to do any, any, any way possible to have conversation around what is the value of being things alone in their natural state and allowing them to be and to give us all of these extraordinary services as a consequence. So mining is just one piece of a broader uh, assault, if you will, on the oceans. Now, admittedly, there are ways in which to extract certain things reasonably, uh, but uh, I'm, I'm in Sylvia's camp. I'm, I, right now, I think we should have a lot more focus in, in repairing what we have done such incredible damage to and spreading the gospel of value uh, of, of things in their natural state. Uh, and as soon as we understand that, we'll have a different sort of uh, ability to articulate an argument because right now the, the arguments are all economic on the extraction side and less clear on the leave it alone side. Um, and that has to be worked on, I believe. Thanks, then. Um, so, and Sophia, I would like to hear your perspective on that too. How'd you, how'd you get into this issue? Sure, thank you, Rep. And uh, I would like to say firstly that I'm very, very happy and honored to be in this amazing panel. So firstly, thank you very much. Um, and to present you very briefly uh, the work that I'm doing now, uh, uh, dealing with YouTube and mining. Uh, I'm working with SOA European uh, hubs, such as SOA Portugal, SOA Benelux, and SOA, uh, SOA France. Um, and we are now focusing on a kind of deep cement mining literacy program. So our very first goal is really to popularize key facts and key scientific conclusions uh, on deep cement mining to uh, the younger generations. So this is through uh, building a broader European uh, extension strategy of the Sustainable Ocean Alliance and to engage the most more, more young people as possible through social media, through campaigns, and through when it will be possible again, hopefully soon, uh, physical events, of course, as well. And I think I wanted to get involved on that um, specific subject, because to me, if I try to see this bit mining through a uh, generational lens, I think our generation is very much at the crossroads of two major trends that this bit mining is um, highlighting. So we are the internet generation as much as we are the climate activist generation. And we were born with a digital revolution. We were we all use social media, we all use phones and technologies. And we also 
aspire at least uh, to uh, the find solution to climate crisis. So to me, it's uh, I wanted to yeah work on the subject because it's almost um, uh, I think a subject that every young people should uh, care about. So that's why our very first goal is to um, to talk about it and to building networks uh, in Europe in order to popularize uh, the scientific and uh, facts around the issue. Um, thanks. So, so something I wanted to follow up on something you said, uh, and Sven also touched on this. Um, so, what what do you say to advocates of deep sea bed mining? Who argue that the practice will drive economic development and afford humanity with abundant cheap materials? Yeah, I'd love to hear like your, how you push back on that on that argument that's often made. We need to rethink what we call value. We have looked at the ocean throughout our history about value is what we can take out of the ocean as products or food or whatever and to use the ocean as a place to put things we don't want close to where we live. It's a dump site, it's a source of, of goods. We have come to the point where for the first time we're able to put in perspective the real value of the ocean. The most important thing that we extract from the ocean is our existence. If the ocean is in trouble, we're in trouble. The ocean is in trouble. We can see it, we can measure it. It connects directly to climate. It connects directly to the diversity of life. There are big projects around the world protecting the diversity of life on Earth. The greatest diversity is in the ocean. The greatest wildlife trade is in the ocean. You know, we sell fish as if they're just products instead of thinking them as wildlife, part of the systems that keep us alive. So the deep sea, we just basically opened it for access. It's like every other place on the planet. If you come to an old growth forest, what do we tend to do? We cut them down and turn the trees into board feet of lumber. Similarly, we're trying to take this ecosystem that is truly diverse and rich. We know enough to know that that's true, that even in the mud, these are communities of life that we're just beginning to understand, right down to the microbial diversity. We know that, we didn't know 50 years ago that we are alive because of the, our microbial systems. The ocean is alive because it's loaded with microbes. And it's true in the deep sea as well. Those manganese nodules, we think of them as dead stones. They're not. They're living rocks. Bacterial action over not just hundreds or thousands, but millions of years taking out of the seawater and actively still growing, still alive, if you will, to take the bits of the minerals that are in the ocean and depositing them. Okay, so we do cut down trees that are a thousand years old as if it's our right to do so. We're re beginning to rethink the wisdom of that. Should we not be re you know, proactively think of the wisdom of taking things that will take literally millions of years to replicate for short-term interests? The principal justification now is, well, you know, climate change, we have to have batteries and the minerals that are in those battery, in those manganese nodules, it's not just magnesium, it's, it's lithium, it's this whole range of rare earths that are just there waiting to be picked up and they create the feeling that you can take them without disturbing anything and they are portrayed as just dead rocks, not as living, growing, like a, like a very slow growing coral reef, creating also a habitat for all sorts of other things that we're just beginning to discover. So it just seems arrogant to think that the best and highest use of this extraordinary system should be to grind it up for short-term use 
where will batteries be in 10 years? Maybe we won't even need lithium. Maybe we won't need the rare earths that seem now so precious. And you think about what we thought was so important 100 years ago that we don't think is important today. Anyway, I, to those who say it's an economic thing that will benefit the people, I say, okay, think it through. Who's really benefiting? It's mostly the investors, or, or rather the, those who are being, receiving the investment, the mining companies. They're selling a dream. They're selling a vision. But are they actually going to be able to produce what they say they will? And if so, at what cost? The cost is something all of us will bear, not just now, but for, you know, thousands of years in the future. And it's just... It's, it's the short-term thinking to benefit a few at the cost of everyone for all time to come. Thanks, Sylvia. Um, so, so Sven, you're, you're, you're an example of someone who's actually benefited from, uh, from the, the healthy and productive ocean ecosystem. So you're kind of the opposite case of showing that there are likelihoods that can be sustainable if you generated from you know, this incredible resource. So I'd, yeah, I'd like to hear your thoughts on, you know, the arguments, um, you know, that you put up against uh, deep sea mining or deep sea bed mining, but then also um, just in running your business, um, how have you navigated the hard choices between maximizing short-term profit versus the well-being of the planet? It's not a choice necessarily. <laughs> uh, well, so it this way. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, for example, doing what I do uses carbon uh, carbon is necessary uh, oil is necessary to drive ships don't feel too good about that uh constantly looking for ways to improve that but to me i, I figured out uh, at least on a personal level that life is a scale to some degree there are positive components to it and there are negative components and and, and you're and, and i sort of look at a scale constantly in terms of evaluating anything uh anything we do as a business and if the if the uh, really outweighs the negative, I feel good about it. Or, you know, I feel sanguine about it. Not perfect about it, but about it. So, for example, if I weigh the use of, which, by the way, we're carbon neutral, not to suggest that offsetting is the end all and be all, but we do offset every aspect of our, of our business 100%. But uh, if I think, if I weigh the negative of that, with the positive of showing people the wonder of these places and having them become sort of soldiers for, for perhaps a different way of viewing natural resources, I feel that that outweighs the carbon use. Uh, now, lots of people will argue against that and to think that that's not a justifiable position. And I respect that and I understand that point of view, but I. I, I have asked that question of myself often when I have come to the conclusion that educating people and uh, exposing them to not only the wonder, but the challenges associated with maintaining the wonder uh, is, is a valuable concept. I'd love to have you take expeditions to the deep sea, Sven. <laughs> <laughs> one day, so oh, you're up on day. the surface. But one day. It, if you could do for the deep sea what you have done for so much in more accessible parts of the planet, I think I think there would be a different conversation going on right now. It's it's ignorance about the nature of what's at stake that causes people to just look at the at the benefit side and not think about the, the cost. So. So, so, so Daniel and, and, and Sophia on the, on, on the um, I guess, awareness side, you know, as young campaigners, you're having to go out and, and sell the concept of holding off on deep sea, deep, deep sea deep seabed mining to your peers. Um, what is the, some of the challenges you faced in trying to engage people around this issue? And how do you, how do you overcome those, those challenges? And do you want to go first? You can go. Okay. Well, if the, the Peruvian Ocean um, has around 200 nautical miles of, from the coast, and most of it is 
deep sea. If I go down to an average of 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 meters, the water temperature is so cold that I will die of hypothermia. If the pressure is so high that I could not be able to, to even move around well or survive breathing in there. I cannot even see my hand because it's so dark. But they, those ecosystems have been steady for such a long time. They have so little disturbance that they're filled with biodiversity. And in Peru, we don't have marine protected areas. Less than 1% of our ocean, of, of our Peruvian ocean is protected. These are very vulnerable to any company that wants to come and just extract this. What we are doing, for example, we've been advocating first with political campaigns, um, presidential candidates precisely. We have been able, elections are next year, to put the 10-year moratorium on the agenda of one of the main presidential candidates right now. That's going to be uh, run. One of the, the first female presidential candidates, Veronica Mendoza in Peru. She has in her agenda and environmental agenda, a 10 year moratorium for deep sea bed mining. That's the way we're doing it. First, we were really scared when we mentioning the obstacles that you talked about. When we were first going to universities to give talks about deep sea bed mining and what's coming ahead, people were saying like, maybe don't speak about it too loud because maybe there's a lot of people that want to invest in that and you're going to start going to the wrong side. But we believe that first policy is the first way we have to go with this, this elections that are coming because most of it is political willingness to, to stop it and prevent it. And then we're going to the citizens to, to educate and to move around that. So I think that's one of the main ways we, we're trying to, to move it around. And uh, regarding our uh, campaign in Europe, I would say that one of the first a uh, challenge that we are trying to overcome is that the, the subject of deep sea bed mining is deeply unknown to the greater public. And uh, even for people working maybe in the field of ocean conservation, uh, they may, even they uh, who are very close to the subject maybe um, don't have access to uh, the, how much the issue is concerning every uh, one of us, actually. So um, one of the related challenges that um, we have also highlighted is um, the lack of transparency uh, in the, um, the decision-making process, and uh, that's what we heard in the last uh, panel. I totally agree with the fact that we need to move towards a community-led uh, movement in order to move towards um, sustainable use of the ocean uh, rather than rushing uh, for, as Sylvia Earl just say, a short-term uh, view or short-term profit. So, um, the campaign that uh, the Ocean, the Sustainable Ocean Alliance and the Oxygen Project are launching uh, is, for me, a huge catalyst to, to change and to mobilize the greater public because um, in Europe we have a big uh, subject um, that is that most, uh, at least a big part of the mining companies that uh, are on the list of exploration and exploitation of the deep sea are based in Europe. And so as young people, as consumers, as voters, uh, we all can mobilize uh, to, uh, to wait in the decision-making process. And uh, I guess that's really what um, I want to get involved in, and uh, I, uh, I see the SOA Europe is, uh, growing, uh, growing towards. So, so, so you, you mentioned um, you know, overcoming ignorance, Daniel, you mentioned political action. Um, I'd, I'd love to hear from Sylvia and then in terms of what do you see as the most critical catalyst for driving public action on, on deep sea mining and, and what should that action be? Did you ask that of? Sorry, I asked it of, of, of you and, and Sylvia. Honestly, it's hard for me to imagine how there are certain uh, se sectors of society which you can, you know, business sectors, specific political sectors, where you can focus on the subject specifically. But broadly, I, I, I would personally not uh, advocate isolating deep sea mining or any particular aspect of the ocean because I think that it's, it's too narrow. I, I, I would focus on the importance of, of ocean health broadly, 
of which deep sea mining is a component along with many other components. And, and, and really, folks personally, I try and develop a campaign to focus on understanding and, 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 and propagating the concept of value that is not rooted in extraction as its core. Uh, and that if we start leaving uh, some of these places, allow the old growth forests to stay intact, if we allow marine systems to not be harvested or overly, certainly overly harvested, there will be huge benefits to society, to jobs, to humanity, uh, to their fellow creatures in the ocean and in the forest over time. And we, it's just, it's just, it, it needs, I think what we need is a real deep metal shift away from the idea of all natural products or are, are just there for us to harvest. That's that's the value. That, that's where we're wrong in the, in the first place. We, we, we need to just redefine what we define as valuable uh, at, at, a, at a core philosophical level and at an economic level, because we will, uh, if we continue on the path that we're on, generally speaking, as it relates to natural resources, there will be no value left. And it's gone. And once it's gone, it's gone. Uh, and, and, and so we can't just sort of, I think, isolate things too much. This is a really, really broad issue in terms of human relationship with natural systems. Here, here. I can add a bit to that. First, I think everyone should be required to, in the context of deep sea mining, go see Avatar where the blue people are subject to mining interests. They want unobtainium at all cost. And in the end, the, the message of protecting the, the systems that keep you alive. The, you know, the, the wonderful and the terrible thing is that this is the first time that we have known enough to begin to truly appreciate the value of nature as our life support. That throughout all of our history, we have taken, taken, taken as a way to foster prosperity. You know, you cut the trees, you mine the minerals, you use the water as if all the water is ours to use, rather than thinking of ourselves as part of this fabric of life and that we have to behave ourselves and not destroy the systems that not just we, but all life really holds together. And the first time we've been able to begin to understand the big word biogeochemistry. We ought to learn it when we're first able to speak and get our letters and numbers in order with, you know, as children. We've got to keep the way the world functions safe. It's our life support system. Do everything you can to learn about it. Do everything you can to take care of it. Astronauts know this. Any of us who go down in the little submarines know this. We're just as society beginning to understand in this past year has been like a two by four, you, whoever you are, you're vulnerable. Viruses don't care. You're just a piece of meat to them, to that particular one. Most viruses are beneficial. We need them. Most bacteria are like this. Whatever it is, they shape the biogeochemistry of the planet that is a miracle in a universe that is really unfriendly. We've got to take care of Earth. Or, or else <laughs> we'll just be another momentary blip in this long history of life on Earth. We have the unique capacity, maybe it's unique, of being able to see the whole and realize that because we're connected, we're connected right now, you know, vicariously, but we're speaking from different parts of the planet in a way and in connecting our minds, we could not do this 50 years ago. 
we couldn't. We, we now have that gift of being able to see for the first time and act on knowledge that exists for the first time. And so why would we continue to do the things that have gotten us into this downhill destabilization, this de unraveling of our life support system? We, we really have the evidence. We also have the power to go from this, to come in this direction. But what does that take? It means holding on to every bit of, of those systems that are still in reasonable shape, especially those like old growth forests, just a fraction remain, but they're really precious. The deep sea, huh, old growth manganese nodule fields, don't mess them up. It's part of what holds the plant steady. I mean, if you want to further disrupt things, then, you know, do exactly what the mining companies are suggesting. Let's just go out and take what we want and throw the rest back into the ocean and and leave. But what you've left behind is is like, imagine bombing Europe. <laughs> we did that. But Europe probably has recovered from World War II faster than manganese nodule fields in the deep sea will recover from mining. You know, it will never be the same. They speak of, we'll put the pieces back, we'll, you know, we'll restore them. And yeah, well, that's, if you don't know what they're, what's the, the real process of restoring, you, you'll never put it back. It'll, it might over a few million years reassemble in some fashion, but it won't be what it now is. Uh, thanks, Sylvia. So, so if we're thinking about how to drive a uh, you know, like systemic transition through a campaign, um, obviously we have um, two very different groups. You know, in this panel, we have um, folks with a lot of experience and people who are just new to this space. So, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit about the inter intergenerational dynamics of how generations can work together to, to make a movement uh, impactful and successful. So, for um, you know, Sylvia and Sven, you know, that would be. Um, Sometimes young people have a hard time speaking to older generations about the environment and conservation. So what do you see as the best best ways for younger generations to have conversations with older generations about these issues in a way that's relevant? And then for Daniel and, uh, and Sophie, like your um, your perspective on, you know, what you think you can take away in terms of advice, skills, benefits from people who've been in this space for longer and more experience um, in order to move the needle on. So, um, uh, and so why don't we start with you? With who? Yeah. Oh, uh, oh. you uh, mean Sven? So, no, you, I think. No, no, okay. you, you, oh. yes. <laughs> okay, um, so yeah, I think uh, the intergenerational, sorry, um, uh, aspect of discipline mining is really, really crucial. And you, for instance, both have uh, experiences, unique experiences. You both uh, went to uh, far wide places, unexplored places. Sylvia, you went diving uh, to the bottom of the sea and everything uh, that you've seen that you uh, bring back from those experiences uh, uh, to me is truly, truly, um, uh, we, we need to have them in our campaigns. So the the work um, that uh, Carly Wiener, for instance, and her team are doing, the work that uh, Oceanex have been doing, that all the deep sea, um, scientists, explorers are doing to share their, their data and to share uh, their experiences, to share what they bring back from the depth in some ways. Uh, to me, this is a very big uh, catalyst and we can use the social media, for instance, and, and uh, all the youth movements uh, that are growing over the years to uh, vehiculate your experiences and to, to have your, um, yeah, your, your point of views, which are really unique, uh, spread to the most people possible, you know, because uh, you, you are very, uh, you, you have unique lives, you know, you <laughs> hmm. Jump in on that. Yeah, sure. Um, I've been part of the COP delegation in Peru. Uh, I was back in last year in, in Madrid. 
and I was the youngest member that assisted the cop there. And they were all um, older than me. And sometimes I think um, I, I felt like I've been really nervous to reach to older generations. And I feel the older gen the generations are a little bit nervous of reaching to us too. So I, I really did, did not see that as a problem before. I thought they just didn't want to talk to us. They just didn't want to, want to, uh, they, 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 they thought that they knew much more than we know. I mean, they know a lot more, but I've, I figured that a lot of it has to do with their nervous of speaking to us on, on all the issues. And I think one of the things that's different in the older generations that from us is most of them has been, have already been carried away to a systematic world and they have already adapted to a world that's so convenient. While we are still being flexible on the way we want the world to be constructed, and we can still think about ways to deconstruct our views, deconstruct, just like we can de deconstruct the gender, deconstruct masculinity, that's toxic. We can deconstruct also the ways we're looking at the environment again. And I think um, we young people, we're saying, I mean, when we see like people, millionaires that are on the magazines, we're like, hey, we don't need that much to be happy. You know, we really don't need that much. It's really not sustainable to have people that have that much um, on the world today when we're 7 billion people that all want to reach to that. I mean, I think in Peru, one of the ways we're looking is let's go look into our native communities, how they can be so happy and they can be so healthy and so resilient to diseases also when, um, by the way they're living and so satisfactory in the in the way of that and i think that on the debate of also talking about intergenerational we sometimes only include academic intergenerational like older people that are wiser in our academic perspective but i think when we talk about intergenerational generational we also need to talk about interclasses inter different ways of life we need to talk to the people that are in the jungle rainforest that know how to live with the artisanal fisheries that we young people don't usually speak to because we feel more um, that we know more than they do. So I think that's also one, one of the issues in the intergenerational is how we deconstruct ourselves, how we create a more creative, a way we can degrowth and grow together as, as uh, in unity and also a way we can talk to people that are different than us. So, so Sven and Sylvia, the inter intergenerational question. Yeah, so uh, I think your last, uh, your last phrase uh, was a key one, uh, Daniel, which is t uh, learning to be able to talk to people that are different than us. So interesting because I mean, whether it's you want to call it intergenerational, I think it happens across all, all kinds of sectors. So I think people uh, more and more are speaking to people uh, who believe like them and rejecting people who, who believe differently, which is really unfortunate because I mean, the way we all grow is by being exposed to people, ideas, thoughts that are different than, than our own that, that might influence our thinking. Uh, might give it some richness or or whatever, but uh, but what what you know it's it's so I think the, everything that sort of divides people I find kind of curious and unfortunate whether it be by age whether it be by societal standing whether you know as a, a a person like you were referring to you know I did, in an ideal world you would have the ability for a person that had done very very well in modern business and. And, and an Indian from the Amazon, a native Indian from the Amazon, be able to find some element of commonality because at the end of the day, they're both they're both human and they're all, both part of this world and and, and find respect in each other. I, we there are so many different kinds of people, there's so many different ages, so many different everything that that, that the people who are really developed a facility to be able to engage with others in a respectful and meaningful manner are, are going to be the people who have the greatest influence uh, and the people who you know dig in are, are going to have very limited influence because they will be speaking to and, 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 and have meaning to a very few people as a consequence. So being open-minded about whether you're young or whether you're old 
whatever you are is really a big deal. <laughs> That's far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Yeah. Sven, if I could jump in, I'd like to underscore that approach that it isn't just age, it's all the things that either bring us together or keep us from not sharing uh, whatever it is, <laughs> life. But here's the cause for me, the cause for real hope. I think about what I knew when I was 10 years old as compared to what the 10 year olds of today, let alone the 20 year olds, what we've learned across all of civilization in the last half century. You know, you could say it's almost could exceed everything that's been learned before. Of course, we're building on knowledge acquired before about letters and numbers and and how to make stuff, like clothing and shoes and books and things. But generally speaking, the insight that has been gained across the world, across cultures, the knowledge base is just like this. So kids, by the time they're your age, have acquired this collective knowledge that I didn't have, Sven didn't have when we were kids. It's taken us longer than it is taking. You come with a head start. So you have this, we're all 21st century humans. That's the thing that we have access to knowledge, not just by waiting for a book to arrive or news to come years after somebody has made a discovery on the other side of the world. It's instant knowledge it's not quite that but it's it's this uh, growth as never before of knowing who we are where we've come from that might prepare us to where we might be going and we, we need all the good minds at whatever age whatever color whatever language whatever culture to think about the fix we are now in earth is in trouble we need to pull together, find a common ground, common ocean, common whatever it is, and say, what have you got? What have you got over here? How can we take our individual talents, power, the superpower of knowing? And first priority has to be we've got to keep the world safe. After that, we can, and, and to realize that it isn't always about taking more of the natural world it's about making good with what we've got i mean that's the key to quote sustainability but respecting the the systems that we don't know how to build an old growth forest we, we, we don't have a clue we can put trees back but we can't put all the little pieces that make a system it has taken all preceding history to get to this point in a few months, you can chop it down and grind it up and sell it, but the same is true in the, in the ocean. Coral reefs, we don't know how to start from scratch. We can plant corals that we have grown in a laboratory and put them out in the ocean. That's not a coral reef. You need the octopus, you need the grouper, you need the this, you need the that, you need a, like a city is not just about the buildings. The manganese nodule field is not just about the manganese nodules. <laughs> It starts with life, bacteria, and all the rest that makes the system function. I think the greatest gift of the deep sea may be using it as a library of knowledge. What can we learn that will really benefit us and enable us to make peace with the natural world and maybe among ourselves to treat all of it with dignity and respect and, and respect what others have to say what they think listen to them but realize that for you this century is your century this is your little chunk of time and then you'll be where Sven and I are now you know <laughs> having learned a lot and experienced a lot 
<laughs> and we we want you to succeed. We want our lives to have mattered in a way that adds to our species and our survival as a species. What, what really matters? Do we want to be remembered as the generation that gobbled up everything in sight and nothing left for the next ones? Imagine, who do you respect from the past? Those who established national parks and protected the assets, if you will, or those who burned through the assets and now they're gone. The lost species that we can't put back because we we killed the last great auk. The last dodo was gobbled up by somebody. <laughs> Nobody thought about why it mattered to keep them in the future. But now we know. There's no excuse for that kind of behavior anymore. So we're we're running short on time. I still have a ton of questions, but I do want to give an opportunity to the audience to ask some questions. So I'm going to ask one more question, then we'll take some questions from the audience, and then we'll see where things end up. But I still, you know, list. so um, just before we jump into the questions from the audience, we'll give, give folks a couple minutes to, you know, to send those in. Um, I just wanted to ask one more question um, to the panel, and that is just just really short. Like, what would be your top call to action in terms of what people can actually do today to make a difference, either on deep deep seabed mining specifically or ocean ocean health generally? So, um, Daniel, let's start with you. But again, you know, just like a real short, you know, sense. Of yeah, I think the moratorium, the 10, 10 year moratorium, will be here basically to start. And yeah, Sophie. Adding to the moratorium, I think uh, supporting the 30 by uh, 2030 ocean treaty would be also an amazing catalyst because uh, this would enable to protect 30% to protect of the ocean through marine protected areas. Um, so yeah, calling uh, on, the, on the protection of the ocean. Uh, vote would be one of many. Use your power to vote so that the right people get into office. Thanks, Sylvia. Hear, hear. And I wholeheartedly endorse the 10 year moratorium, at least. I wholeheartedly endorse protecting 30% of the ocean and the land, at least. But don't stop there. We have to think about taking care of what each of us can do every day. Use your superpower of knowledge and use it to take care of, of the natural world that takes care of you. Great. So I think we're going to get a lot of questions. So um, in terms of responding to these panel, I, I would just, if you, you know, keep responses fairly short so we can get through as many as possible. This is a question for Daniel. So according to you, what is the most radical way to get the ISA or ESA uh, to be more transparent and accountable? accountable? And how do we bring them into the light? You might want to say what I say. Okay, this is a very interesting question. I know the the ISA um, that regulates all the international uh, seafloor. They are the judge, and they also receive money when they give exploration. So I think they need to um, like renounce to all the money that comes in from deep sea and from deep sea mining i think they need to be funding from from a different different ways i don't think they should be funding directly funded directly by deep sea mining because that's going to to obviously motivate the reasons of license from there and yeah i think that'll be the answer to my question um, so every day we're met with a deluge of bad news in the environment. Um, what what gives you hope and how do you stay energized and motivated? I know that's a big question, but I'd love to get people's thoughts. Protection works. When you take the pressure off, we can see that where we stop killing and start caring, recovery is possible. <laughs> and I mean, Wholeheartedly, I endorse the concept of looking at half the world, the high seas, where much of the deep sea mining, that's where the International Seabed Authority has authority. Let's put a moratorium on all extractive action and use of the high seas. 
it is the core. It's the blue heart of the ocean. It's the heart of the heart. Let's just keep it safe and use the next 10 years, 30 years, 100 years, whatever it takes to really understand how it functions. And to the extent that we do more than just derive the benefits that we do by being alive, life support, then let's figure out how to do it in a, in a way that really does it, non-destructive. I think what SPEN's enterprise does is, is basically the answer in a way to get people to understand by experiencing the reality. So, so Sven, what, what gives you hope? Well, kiss me. Well, uh, looking at people like Daniel and Anne Sophie, the, the young people who uh, care deeply about these subjects and, and will have to carry the baton, right, uh, forward, uh, that gives me tremendous hope. Because, I mean, the ingenuity of the human being is enormous. And uh, once we put our mind to certain things, we're capable of doing remarkable things. I'm actually more hopeful now than I was five years ago. Five years ago, I was getting really, really depressed. I, I said, we, we, we're just not even thinking about this, these kinds of things. And I've seen the conversations escalate in terms of importance. And I'm hopeful about that. That's nice to hear. Daniel? I have a lot of hope that what we're going to do in this 10 years from 2020 to 2030 will actually play an important role. So I have a lot of hope in the next 10 years and that we are going to stop fearing those called radical measurements because they're not radical at all. They're all public health. They're public. They're well, whatever you do to an animal, whatever you do to the ocean, you're doing to yourself. Like Sylvia always says. So yeah, we need to stop fearing. Um, all these measurements that we need to take and we need to go forward instead of always like in Peru for example when we talk about environmental issues it's always with little pieces of touching the environment let's talk about plastic bags let's have a plastic back pain it's come up okay great but let's do much more than that because we're still why don't you go to the company even if we have a plastic band band back band they're still producing plastic let's go to do them and tell them something I mean, we need to stop seeing the environmental issues just like that. I mean, it needs to be a priority over all other issues right now because it's a life um, issue. Sophie? Uh, yeah, I think what gives me um, the most hope is the rest uh, of the ocean. Like Sylvia just said, uh, protection works. And when we give the ocean the time to heal, the time to recover, uh, the impacts are just wonderful for uh, the environment, for uh, local communities, but also for us all as humanity. And given our position in the race to stay below the two degrees uh, Celsius uh, temperature rise, uh, we can't afford to lose the biggest carbon sink of our planet. We can't afford to lose uh, the last very large ecosystem that is still to be discovered and to be studied. So. Um, yeah, I think the resilience and the fact that uh, marine protected areas and moratorium has a huge impact uh, is what gives me the most hope. Great. Um, so this is a question for you. Um, what is your advice on implementing the business, uh, the business perspective into campaign, into a campaign advocacy strategy around uh, deep sea bed mining? So like, what can you take from the, the private sector and apply to a effort to you know, advance um, momentum for moratorium, for example. Yeah, well, I mean, in many ways, you, I mean, this sounds sounds kind of awful on one hand, but if you if you think of things uh, almost as a product that you've got to sell, I mean, if you, you believe in something, you've got to sell it. And so the same, if you want to sell toothpaste or you want to sell the idea of a moratorium, some of the same ideas have to come into play. <laughs> How do you make people want what it is that you're selling? And so, you know, if you study, for example, one of the things that the conservation uh, community, I don't mean to be mean spirited about the conservation community, has not necessarily done as good a job as it could, is in effective communication. And where do you learn about effective communication? Well, you probably learn about it from the people who 
are going to live and die by effective communication from the perspective of they'll get tired if they don't do it properly or their businesses will go out of business. And, 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 and there's a lot to be learned there. Uh, because at the end of the day, if you, you, you believe in something and you, you, and you understand it and you've done the homework, that's got nothing to do with the person that you want to convince. They, they have a very different relationship to whatever it is that you're selling in essence. And you have to be sympathetic and, and, and uh, of that. You have to try and figure out how you're going to get your thoughts, your ideas into their space in a way where they're going to do something that you would like them to do. And that's not an easy idea. That, that, that's hard work. I totally agree with what you're saying. The ocean needs a good PR agency, or, but it has to be the constraint that has made it difficult for conservation and science is the, the mandate to tell the truth. If you're in a mining company, if you're selling toothpaste, you don't necessarily have to tell everything. You, you just have to say those things that you, you want people to believe. The mining company is selling a dream, a vision. They aren't they're not bothering to tell you the downside. They just want to, and, and they've got the resources, the money behind it to create marketing campaigns that market what they want you to believe. And the truth is sometimes kind of left in the corner somewhere. Mm -hmm. We need better marketers of the truth, of the reality and why it matters, why it really matters to yeah. you, everyone. But what, what, one, of, one of the things, just, I don't mean to interrupt yeah, no, you, Sylvia, one, 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 of, one of the things that, 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 that environmentalists have to their advantage, if they can figure out how to harness it, is the greatest product on earth a healthy environment is the greatest product on earth. That's true. I mean, it's the most, it brings joy, it brings wonder, it brings health, it brings uh, economic value, it brings, it's, 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 like, it's, the, it's like the most perfect idea in the world wrapped up beautifully. And so smart people should be able to figure out how to sell that idea. Let's do it. Let's go. It's, I think we're it's the truth. smart people on the screen right now. <laughs> I mean, so on that on that final point, so you just got a minute left here, but um, Daniel and, and Sophie, so like, what what would be that message that you would give to other young people to get involved and have an impact on that, you know, PR marketing aspect? How to make the ocean famous? Um, well, let's talk about it everywhere. I mean, every discussion, the ocean needs to be in the economic agenda, like we're talking with Sven right now. It needs to be in the political agenda. It's very important that we get there politically and bring the ocean agenda in there. It needs to be also with influencers, with artists, in music, everywhere. I mean, whatever profession you are, you need to bring the ocean in there. People need to know about it. And the way we're going to do it is with you, whatever profession you are. Definitely agree with you. And uh, one thing that I may um, add is that we um, often forget the weight that we have as consumers as well uh, by choosing to support uh, sustainable uh, businesses, small businesses, by uh, consuming wisely and products, fish, especially that uh, are fish sustainably and not uh, contribute to overfishing. Uh, I think by consuming, um, we can also have a lot of uh, power, of course. Great. Well, I've learned a lot today. Um, thank you all for your time. Um, please join us on the main stage uh, for the next uh, conversation, which is mobilizing to defend the deep, uh, which is a closing keynote and call to action with Jane Fonda. So thank you again, um, everyone, for, for joining us. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. Good morning. Good evening. Wherever you're tuning in from, I'm Vassar Seidel, and I'm the Deep Sea Mining Campaign Director at the Oxygen Project. I have the privilege to talk about the top three things we need to do to galvanize momentum for a moratorium and how you can join us and take action. Today, I'm joined by Farah Obaidullah. Farah, before we get started, will you tell us a little bit about yourself? 
Sure. Thank you, Vassar. Thanks for having me today. Uh, so yeah, my name is Farah Obaidula, and I've been a long time uh, ocean advocate for about 17 years now, trying to protect the ocean from the many threats it faces. I've been working on uh, climate change, protected areas, fish crimes at sea, sustainable seafood. Uh, yeah, a number of really important issues. Um, I most recently joined the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition as their global campaigner to secure a moratorium on deep sea bed mining. And I also run a platform called Women for Oceans, which is about amplifying and connecting the voices of women in particular in the ocean space and why? Well, because I, I, you know, the ocean belongs to all of us. And I believe that, um, you know, we've exhausted so many uh, avenues, you know, to try to reverse the crisis that our planet is, is facing. And what we need to do is really bring the diversity of voices to the table to ensure that all of us get a say in how we govern, how we manage, and how we make decisions for our oceans going forward. Um, so yeah, that's me in a nutshell. Yeah, well, thank you, Farah, and thank you for coming on today with us. I'm so excited to talk to you about something we're both passionate about, how to get a moratorium and how to take action. So we're really in this moment in time where we have a small opportunity, a small window of opportunity to get ahead of the launch of a new global industry and to really make sure our world leaders are making decisions that are in line with science and on our behalf. So let's just dive right on in. Farah, how do we seize this moment? And what is the first thing we need to do to get a moratorium? Right, well, Vassar, you said it right there. It's an industry that hasn't started yet, right? So we really are at a, at a, you know, at a, at a crossroads or at a cusp, if you like, where we can decide whether we want this industry to go ahead or not. And the science is clear that this is a destructive industry that we do not want to embark on. And so the sooner more of us realize that this is not a road we want to take, then the sooner we're able to communicate that to our leaders and let them know that, you know, citizens have spoken. We don't want to embark on another destructive industry that is going to set us onto an unknown, uh, although destructive path uh, uh, going forward. So that's number one, that we realize what we're, you know, what we're up against, that you know, we don't want to do this, we don't want it. The second thing is to realize is that we don't need it, right? There's, there's something called the circular economy, which I'm sure many of the, your viewers uh, have heard of. You know? And this is where we decide that we want to redesign our products so that they are less wasteful and are less polluting. You know, at the moment, if we look at most of our production cycles, it's about taking and making and wasting. But what we need to do is really, you know, recognize that we've already got so many materials out there in the world. And rather than see them go straight into landfill or into the oceans or, you know, or, or, or be incinerated, why don't we harvest those materials, including heavy metals, and, uh, you know, repurpose them, but bring them back into, into the supply chains so that we have less of a demand for virgin or for you know for new uh, materials going forward. So that's you know that's that's number two is is recognizing that there is a circular economy that many uh, leaders or world leaders have you know pledged that they want to move towards, including the European Union where where I live. Um, you know we recognize that this is what we want to do. We want to have a circular economy. And then, you know, when we know that, then we can also sort of appreciate that in parallel to, uh, you know, to, to building momentum or, or get, developing the infrastructure for a circular economy, we also need to recognize, you know, what are the behaviors, consumption behaviors that we can change, you know, that doesn't require much effort on our part, but, but just recognizing that, hey, I have an old iPhone or I have an old gadget. Um, it can be repurposed, you know, it, it either I can, I can go, go and get it repaired or, you know, I can uh, send it to a company that can make use of the parts, the components of it. Um, so, you know, there's, there's an awareness that comes with, uh, you know, with the circular economy or with the, you know, thinking about the alternatives. And with that awareness also comes innovation. And that's the other point, you know, I think um, 
is, is really important to mention here. We have innovated our way, you know, out of so many crises in the past. I mean, look at what we're doing now with, you know, even with pandemic and how quickly we're able to, to bring about, you know, the, this vaccine. Um, we are innovators. And so if you, if you uh, put forward a challenge of, okay, how are we going to uh, develop our economies, our civilization, our societies, without causing more unnecessary harm to our planet? Because at the end of the day, we only have one planet and it is finite. And so far we haven't, you know, acknowledged that fact or built that into our systems. And so, yeah, that's, uh, that's where, you know, these three things, building a circular economy, uh, recognizing that we, you know, we can change our consumer behaviors uh, so that there is less demand. And three, you know, trying to see where, where we can innovate. And I'm sure that there are many young people watching this or students or, or you know, entrepreneurial people out there watching this. And this is a challenge for all of us. How are we going to innovate our way, uh, you know, to a cleaner and more sustainable future? Yeah. And actually, a lot of people say, you know, a circular economy future and uh, alternatives in our future. But we know that it's not just about the future. These solutions are, you know, being created today and totally within our reach. One example of this is hydroelectric vehicles. They have gotten so much safer um, and they have so much room um, to grow and expand in a market. Also, the co-founder of Tesla, J.D. Straubel, he created a left Tesla and created a recycling company called Redwood Materials. And he has said, as we know, that rare earth minerals are 100% recyclable. So a titan like JV can really, you know, make this uh, recycling and the circular economy um, really expand. So th those are just examples of the f future. And there's other alternatives. Um, there's one company that is uh, right now in stealth mode, but they have a battery that has no rare earth minerals. It's uh, two times more efficient than anything on the market. And it uh, you know, isn't going to be on the market in 10 years. It's going to be on the market um, within the next possibly 12 months. So these are just some examples of this future that we're talking about and the kind of investments that we really want to see if, if we're going to have a truly sustainable future. Do you know any other well, examples? Well, yes, I mean, exactly. We, uh, we know the alternatives exist and it's about scaling them up and investing in them so that they can secure, you know, an alternative to this, to this destructive idea of destroying the seafloor. So um, I, you mentioned uh, Tesla. Well, Tesla, they've already put out a Model 3 car, I believe it is, it's called. Um, that doesn't use uh, these, you know, that doesn't use nickel or cobalt in their batteries. And, and, and so that's already driving out there. Um, and then there's this research that's been done by IBM um, that shows that we don't need, uh, that's a new type of chemistry for batteries, and it also doesn't rely on heavy metals. And that's now being further uh, researched and invested in uh, together with Mercedes-Benz, I believe. Um, and so, you know, so they're working on that alternative. And then there's, I think, uh, even in China, they've they've uh, they've come out with, uh, I think, or they will be coming out with ten new models of, you know, a type of car. I think it's the hydroelectric car that you were referencing. Um, and so these are examples where, you know, this is an opportunity for us. This is an opportunity for us to innovate in a way that that is truly new and 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 truly sustainable, and not go down this path of like. Oh well, we need to, uh, you know, we, we we need to wean off fossil fuels, so we'll just destroy the ocean seafloor instead. I mean, that's that's you know replacing one evil with another, and and we know we don't want that. And like you said, we don't need it. There are alternatives out there. Let's invest in them. And also, Vassar, how? I mean, we don't know what the world is going to look like in fifty years' time, right? We at the at the scale of innovation that we see happening, not just today, but over the last 10, 20, 50 years. 
imagine what's going to be possible in the next 50 years, right? So why start an, 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 an industry that science knows is, going to, is not going to end well for us? Why embark on that? You know, why not invest in the infrastructure that can recycle what we already have out there, invest in the technologies that are showing promise, and innovate our way out of this crisis? Okay, so we know we don't need deep sea mining minerals. <laughs> Farah, what needs to happen to further shift the needle on securing a moratorium? Yeah, so we know we don't need it, we know we don't want it, but who's gonna listen to us, right? I mean, so all of these decisions about the seafloor happen in an obscure, uh, you know, obscure, uh, within an obscure entity called the ISA, the International Seabed Authority. And I bet you hardly anyone's heard of that. And the problem is we need people to understand that it's happening, that the decisions are being made by a handful of countries in this forum, the ISA, and we need world leaders to listen to us, the people, the citizens, and so how do we do that? Well, there, there are several ways. You know, you, 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 know you, you could write directly to your government, for example. But in my experience of campaigning, the thing that governments listen to the, the most are companies, are corporates. They, they can lead the way. And you, we've, we've mentioned Tesla a couple of times, you know, but uh, there are other corporations that rely on heavy metals for their, you know, current sort of gadgets and, 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 and uh, and, and technologies, what we need to do is let them know that we don't want to see this dirty metal, let's say, in, our, in the supply chain of the gadgets that we are going to be purchasing at the end of the day. So getting our corporate leaders, you know, whether they're the Apples or the, uh, you know, or the Teslas or the BMWs or the uh, Microsofts of the world know that this is not okay with us. We don't want this stuff in our supply chains. And if, if, if they can have their voice, if they can make their voice heard to the governmental leaders who go to these meetings at the ISA, you know, then I think we have a, a really good chance of, of um, you know, getting, getting the ISA members to say, okay, well, this is not going to be worth our investment. You know, if we approve this industry, where are we going to get the investment from? Because if the companies don't want it, the investors aren't going to want it either. And, and, you know, unfortunately, the world <laughs> revolves around money. But if we can get those companies to understand that this isn't worth the investment and they won't see returns on it, then, you know, we can hopefully stop this industry before it starts. Absolutely. And, yeah, once this inter industry starts, there is really no putting the genie back in the bottle. And that's why it's really important for corporations to stand up and say, we don't want it. We don't want deep sea mining minerals in our supply chains. And it's also important for people to say, we don't want it. We don't want deep sea mining minerals in our products and technology. So Farah, a lot about being a campaigner is around raising awareness. Where do we, where does the public, where do people come into this strategy of galvanizing momentum at, for achieving a moratorium? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a number of things that, uh, you know, that we could all be doing. I mean, first, it, it does start with awareness, right? The choices we make, we make because we are either, you know, knowledgeable of something or ignorant of something, right? And so we need to start building that knowledge base, not just with ourselves and understanding why we buy what we buy. Do we really need this? Can we do things differently? Can we... Uh, purchase something that's greener or more sustainable. Um, that's an individual choice, and that's a very important choice. But what's also important is to make your voice heard. So, so signing petitions. I think you know you're 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 going to speak to that uh, you, you, the petition that the oxygen pro, uh, or the letter that the oxygen project has. There are uh, I, the D the deep sea conservation coalition, for example, has a. Um, has a call to action page and you can you can go there and write to your government directly um, but you can also be your own advocate you know you can also uh, 
create that awareness in your community, among your friends, among your family, let them know that this is coming. You know, we, I, I, I'm, I'm thinking about, you know, what about a hundred or so years ago when the automobile was first being invented. Um, at the time, there were many different technologies being developed that would power the automobile. And one of them was actually electric. So we were already thinking about electric vehicles at the end uh, of the 19th century or the end of the, the, at, the at the turn of the century, um, end of the 1900s. And at that time, you know, for whatever reason, the fossil fuel industry won out and the, 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 uh, we decided to move forward with combustion uh, cars. And this is where we are now, where we realize, okay, this is a dirty industry. The science has told us that, you know, it's, it's bad for our health, it's bad for our air quality, it, it makes us more susceptible to diseases such as COVID, um, it's changing our climate and so on. And so we made the wrong choice 100 years ago and we're trying to fix that now. And we are at that same crossroads right now with, uh, you know, deciding whether to embark on this, this destructive deep sea uh, mining, or whether to truly innovate a clean uh, and sustainable way of powering our vehicles or our, our society. And, and so let science guide us, let knowledge guide us. There's been too many instances now where we have just ignored the science and it has done, it has led to nowhere good. And so equally in this, in, in, with, with this industry, let science guide us. And the science is telling us we are in, you know, it is, not going to lead to any good. We are certainly not in a position to, uh, you know, to, to, to manage or mitigate any of the damage that deep sea bed mining will do. And, and so let's push that. Let's push our voice and tell our leaders and tell the companies that produce these, these parts, these gadgets, that we don't want this. And so becoming your own advocate means just that informing yourself, telling your communities, telling your friends and family, and that way we can mobilize people um, and have Absolutely. our voice heard. Yeah, have your voice heard. And it really is, this is such an important message for everyone uh, listening to this today because, you know, awareness is the first step, but becoming, like you said, your own advocate and taking this issue into your realm of influence, whether that's your friends, your family, your networks, and to local and national governments, that's what's really going to give this movement its wings. And that's why everyone listening to this, you are important in solving this issue. So far, let's break it down. I know we mentioned this, you just mentioned this a little bit, but let's get really clear on some action items for everyone watching this today mm -hmm. to kickstart their own advocacy. So do you wanna um, give us some of those? I know the DSCC has some really great ways to engage with your governments. Right, well, if you, if you go to the website, savethehighseas.org, uh, you'll see a call to action page. And on that page, you'll find uh, a couple of ways in which you can engage with your, with your government. Um, through email or through uh, through other social media channels, and let them know that you don't want seabed mining to happen. So there's 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 the call to action page on our on on the on our website, um, and then there's the the letter that you uh, that you uh, the oxygen project is putting out. Um, maybe you want to speak to that a bit. Absolutely. So another action you can take. And you can do it right now from your seat or your bed, wherever you're watching this, and open another tab and go to the oxygenproject.com and sign our open letter with the Sustainable Ocean Alliance to the UN and ISA representatives and other world leaders. This letter stands with science, it stands with biodiversity, it stands with current and future generations and people on the front lines. And we're working to make sure it gets into the right hands and that your signature counts. So please uh, take a look at that letter. Also something else that you can do tangibly right now to kickstart your activism is tweet your favorite gadget company, your favorite technology company, and tell them that deep sea 
minerals are a conflict mineral and they have no place in uh, our supply chains for truly sustainable uh, solutions. So we have made it easy to get started. We have a blog post up on the oxygenproject.com with all of these action items, links, and further advice on how to get involved in this issue. So Farah, do you have any closing advice, thoughts, solutions, action items? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's important to remember that, you know, the ocean belongs to all of us. This planet belongs to all of us. We've already lost two thirds of global wildlife. And it, it, it might seem like something that is out of your reach. Uh, you might feel powerless in how to make a change or how to make a difference. But we do have that power. We do. We can make that change. And so you know, by following the action items that we just highlighted, writing to your, you know, tweeting your, your, your favorite gadget company or signing the letters that we, we've just talked about, that's one step. And the other step is really stay engaged. Stay engaged on these issues. Think about other ways that you can help the ocean because it's, you know, deep sea bed mining has no place uh, in, 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 in the ocean, but particularly now at a time when the ocean is facing so much you know, stress from other threats, such as climate change, such as pollution, such as overfishing. And so building that awareness about our impact and what your footprint might be on the ocean and seeing how you might change your lifestyle so that you can, you know, have, have a smaller impact. I think those are, those are really fundamentally important steps for all of us that we can all take and they will make us feel empowered and em I think embolden us. I mean, that's my experience as a campaigner. Once I set those changes in motion myself, I find I am in a better position and, and feel empowered to then go and, and demand that change from the people that are deciding our fate. And those people are elected people. We elect them, we vote for them. They are deciding in, like I said, in an obscure forum, the ISA. And so let's take this issue out of the ISA and make it an issue for all of us to engage in. Absolutely, and I think it's so important what you just said. You know, taking action on the personal level really helps you overcome this anxiety and you know, this idea that this issue is so overwhelming. Um, and just taking action is a great place to start and really the answers will come from there. And so thank you, Farah. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. There is a lot that can happen to move the needle on this issue. But bottom line, we need you as an advocate and a voice for the ocean. So please follow us on socials and become part of our communities at the Oxygen Project and at the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition. Remember, check out that blog and sign the letter on the oxygenproject.com. Together, let's defend the deep so the ocean and humanity can thrive for generations to come. Thank you, Vassar. Thank you, Farah. I applaud the organizers of this event for banding together to defend the deep. We must all do everything we can and fast to protect the ocean's biodiversity and its ability to be one of our greatest allies in fighting the climate crisis. You know, in our hubris, we humans avoid thinking about the fact that our ability to live on this planet is dependent on oxygen, on a certain range of air temperature, on safe potable water and biodiversity, and all of these are under grave and immediate threat. And each has a different set of strategies needed to address the threat, but they all have one threat in common besides our hubris, and that is the burning of fossil fuels. You know, we can have all the wind turbines and solar panels in the world, but if we continue to burn fossil fuels, we're not gonna make it. See, as we burn coal, oil, and natural gas, carbon dioxide goes up into the atmosphere and warms our planet. 
causing climate change. That's, that's what global warming is. But a lot of that carbon dioxide, 40%, in fact, is absorbed directly into seawater, increasing the heat and acidity of the water. And that added acid makes it difficult for organisms like clams and oysters and coral reefs to form calcium skeletons, among other problems that it causes. I'm sure that most of you know why the ocean is such an important friend for us and our fight to slow climate change, but let, let me just state it for the record. Oceans absorb 93% of the heat we generate along with carbon dioxide, as I just mentioned. The deep sea is especially important to the sequestration of what's called blue carbon, the carbon that is naturally absorbed by marine life, especially whales, and which remains stored in the deep sea sediment for thousands of years when the animals die and sink to the bottom. Most importantly, half of the oxygen we breathe comes from the oceans, specifically from phytoplankton, the small creatures that comprise the bottom of the food chain. Oxygen-producing phytoplankton are being degraded by the acidification of ocean water caused by burning fossil fuels. Some have already disappeared. What happens when the phytoplankton are too damaged? We don't know. We're playing Russian roulette with our oceans. The rest of our oxygen, as you probably know, comes from forests, and only 15% of the original oxygen-producing forests are still intact. These threats to our supply of oxygen don't bode well for us humans. Then there's the deep, deep sea that which is deeper than 200 meters and can be as deep as 4,000 meters or more. Those depths hide a unique living world that we barely understand. I encourage everyone to watch David Attenborough's Blue Planet 2. It's a documentary. It's the episode called The Deep on BBC America, where thanks to revolutionary new photography techniques, we're taken to the very bottom of the deepest parts of the ocean and see creatures that no one has seen before. It is mind-boggling and very fragile and, and mysterious. But those mysteries are already under threat from a controversial new industry, deep sea mining, the process of retrieving mineral deposits from the deep sea. As land-based deposits are depleted and demand for minerals are rising, interest in the deep sea is growing, and with it, the threat of commercial mining. The mining companies are going after the, the trillions of polymetallic nodules. These are these are potato-sized deposits loaded with carbon, nickel, manganese, and other precious ores that exist thousands of meters at the bottom of certain parts of the ocean. But see, there are many risks inherent in deep sea mining. First, there's the risk of extinction of unique species. The nodules would take millions of years to physically recover from that mining extraction process. And we don't know if creatures dependent on the nodules can ever recover after their removal. Then in the deep sea, we find underwater mountains that are oases for sea creatures, ancient coral reefs, and sharks that can live for hundreds of years. These are among the longest living creatures on earth, which makes them particularly vulnerable to physical disturbances because of their slow growth rate. Researchers estimate that harm to wildlife from mining is likely to last forever on human timescales. 
As if the total destruction of the sea creatures' homes wasn't bad enough, machines cutting the sea floor will create sediment plumes, which could smother deep sea habitats for kilometers. Have you seen photographs of the Alberta tar sands open mine? Or look down when you're flying over mountaintop removal mines? Imagine that grotesque gouging being done to the deepest, most fragile ocean floor. And then the ships on the surface for the mining operation could also release toxic vapors into the water, harming many ocean species for hundreds or even thousands of kilometers. And it's not just pollution wildlife will have to worry about. Noise generated by churning machinery risks harming and disturbing marine mammals like whales, while floodlighting areas of the dark, deep ocean could cause permanent disruption to sea creatures adapted to very low levels of natural light. Then the machinery would disrupt the natural processes that store carbon in those deep-sea sediments, thereby making climate change worse and might even destroy forever nature's ability to sequester carbon. These are some of the reasons why sending gigantic mining machines designed to bulldoze and churn up the seabed to the uncharted depths of our oceans is clearly very dangerous and must be present, prevented at all costs. I am so grateful to the Sustainable Ocean Alliance and the Oxygen Project and all the youth-led organizations who've banded together to defend the deep. Once again, it's young activists who are raising the alarms and showing us the way and inspiring us. I urge all of you to sign and get your friends and colleagues to sign the official letter to the UN and the ISA calling for at least a 10-year moratorium on deep sea mining in line with the UN Decade of Ocean Science. Thank you.